Hello, and welcome to the News Pace podcast. My name's Johnny Vedmore. You know me. I'm the founder of New Pace, News Paste, of course, and you've been on an adventure with me, and we've been on a fair few podcasts now. Um, I think it's this is number 15, I think, and it's a very interesting one. It's one I'm looking forward to because I really, um, for those who can see the video of this, will see that I do have, as I like to say, a little dog in the fight. I've got a little dog in the fight because I love the Beatles. Uh, the Beatles helped me learn how to play guitar how to write music how to sing songs how to do it all i mean they were like uh, brothers who who taught me how to do the things that i wanted to do um so desperately um and they were massive influence on my my in my whole existence uh, uh blackbird being uh, a song that i learned very early on to schmooze the ladies with and <laughs> this is uh we're talking about one of the main members of the Beatles here we're talking about John Lennon and I'm going to talk to David Whelan and David Whelan has a substack davidwhelan.substack.com at David Whelan um, and an Instagram uh, that is very useful as well assassination of Lennon or one uh, word which has a load of uh, other other stuff on it which looks really intriguing about what we're going to speak about today because we're going to speak about the misconceptions and myths surrounding the um death of john lennon by gunfire um supposedly by mark chapman i'm going to learn more and i thank you david for joining me today uh welcome to the newspace podcast hi johnny thanks for having me okay i hope i did justice and managed to uh, note the places of where people can find you um you did, can you tell you. can you tell people a little bit about yourself and how you got into researching this where, where where did it start off good question um i'm a tv producer by trade uh started working in television in 1983 which is a hell of a long time ago mm -hmm. as a yts trainee do you remember the yts scheme? i was a yeah. yts boy in um black's camping and outdoor once upon a time well there you go that, that, my my lucky it was incredibly lucky uh mm -hmm. was I, I got a yts at thames television uh, in the film oh, department was lucky yeah yeah i, I mean uh, we, we all wanted something like that uh but it, 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 it's really hard to try and get those opportunities well right? yeah it was amazing and, and i was you know i was 17 and i just i was very green and i walked in there and it was basically the houston studios in london thames television it was as close as you can get to hollywood in london and i just couldn't yeah. believe what i was in, in. I, I knew the second i walked in there this is an opportunity i can't blow i have to make the most of this and there was 15 of us who went in on the in on the scheme and i was the only one that thankfully was held on to do a job afterwards um, and i think the only reason johnny that happened wasn't because i was some kind of genius or or anything like that it was just i, I was just out of all the 15 i, I was probably i had the best people skills i, I could talk mm -hmm. to people and i could get on with people and i think it's because a lot of people liked me that they hired me and i think that's a lesson that kids today can yeah. possibly learn yeah. But of course, now they're all stuck in phones and working from home in their I, bedrooms. I, 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 I mean, you know? keep on your keep on your train of thought there. But on mm. on on that there, um, I really, I'm a really like friendly person, and I, I I mean, I'm obviously there's a I would say there's probably a 13 year difference between age between you and I by the sounds of it. Because when I went to do YTS, it was 1996, right? Um, so I was 16. I don't know how much you got paid, but I got paid forty-five pound a week for full time. Twenty-five, wage. twenty-five yeah. a week. Oh well, 25. I'm still. That was really good back in '83. Whoa, twenty-five. That's all right. That's all right. Yeah. Buy your, a nice... yourself a a few wimpy burgers with that. I tell you. Three, three nights down the pub. Three nights down. The Woo! Pub. Three good. nights down the pub, straight <laughs> <laughs> drinking all of the time like a fish under the table. Imagine doing night. that now on twenty-five quid. <laughs> you, you wouldn't get yeah, three, I, three minutes in a pub. I know, I go. know. It's amazing. It, it is. It is. It. I. I can't. I, I just can't wrap my head around prices nowadays. Um. But let's not get into old man talk. Uh, yeah, let's but, not. So, so, <laughs> so we got this. You, you know, you're talking about um 
being polite, friendly, and happy. And I, I, I had the experience that by the time when I was polite, friendly, and happy by the nineties, everybody had gone through the eighties and were no longer polite, friendly, and happy. Um, and everybody hated the fact of people being polite, friendly, and happy. So I got uh, chastised <laughs> for being too friendly all the time. Literally, in multiple jobs, I got sat down over uh, loads of uh, over a period from that that job that i had in as a, a yts recruit or, or for about probably about 10 15 years i was told uh continuously that i was too happy and too friendly with everybody and i'm not talking right. about friendly like touchy touchy or anything yeah yeah just, I mean, just a just nice like, guy yeah, oh, yeah, he yeah. talks to people all the time yes it makes some people uncomfortable yeah, but it makes a load of other people feel even more comfortable. And that's, and you know, I was working in hotels. I was working in the hotel mm. industry on the front desk of hotels. Wow. And, wow. And in, as a manager in hotels, and I was continuously called aside for years and multiple, I, told, I was too friendly. That's too crazy. Happy. And I was mad. too I was too nice with people, all of this sort of stuff. And yeah, I, I did I, I found it mad, but that's because a lot of the people who rise to the top in hotels are complete narcissists who have no emotional content and it makes them feel uncomfortable so i think it was the mm. industry i was in as well i would have loved to have found a um, an industry uh at, in the 90s in the mid 90s that would have accepted that and have said oh you know oh he's really friendly and now it, my friendliness is like this is a time this is the era that, for, for friendliness i find because i go around being really nice to everybody all the time being really friendly and i'm able i use that as a tool to be able to see who and this is why it's such a good tip to see who's nasty because if someone's nasty to me when i'm lovely to them then i know it's not me and i know i can keep just going on down the road and i don't have to have that person in my life so it works in multiple ways not only do you attract mm. the best people and the best opportunities eventually if you're given those opportunities but you're also like you know you're able to see who the bad actors are it's much easier to see if you go around having a positive outlook so i'm not surprised about that i'm glad to hear that it worked out for you in the 80s um <laughs> yeah, very i mean beyond lucky johnny yeah. you know it's, TV. All, it's all chance yeah it's all chance so what, yeah. what i mean I, I so you you, you how do you rose to like become a producer yeah yeah what was a good YTS was, boy that's gotta yeah, be yeah. That's, that's quite yeah. good you gotta be proud of that well thames was very unionized at the time it was it was actt they were called they're called back to now and it was heavily heavily unionized and it was actually a big problem for me to get a ticket because the unions hated the, the YTS scheme because they felt it was Thatcher exploiting oh, yeah, the yeah, youth. Yeah. So I was, I was hated by all the union bigwigs. Uh, but luckily, again, pure luck. Uh, next door in the road, next door to me, uh, I played with a guy, I knew a guy, played football with him, and his dad was a big union wig in, in Thames. Oh, here you go, and yeah. it, 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 it just uh, luck, pure luck. Just everything okay, to so, line up. So, so some people, because a lot, load of my audience will be in America, they won't understand mm. what you mean by uh, union. But I, I mean, as far as I know, the media is unionized to an extent that to join certain uh, aspects of it, you have to be a member of the union. And you're saying that they only gave away a certain amount of tickets to obviously. They did limit the amount of people yeah, who were able exactly. to join the union and be able to get those opportunities and yeah. they obviously looked at people like yts people as being um low <laughs> yeah low, well, low uh, cast even worse a thatcher kind of experiment they saw me as that mm -hmm. you know was exploiting the youth on on crap wages and which uh, which it was i mean i mean to a degree it, yeah it yeah was. yeah yeah was. i know that when i was doing a yts course for 45 quid a week and i was working full-time shift and being treated like crap all of the time i was like this is slavery <laughs> but True. but it did get me jobs afterwards that then it did, it allowed did. me it, some it, form it, of independence it, 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 they should do it more now. It, allowing someone to get their foot in a door in an industry allows them to see that industry and for the industry to see them. And then, you know, you can figure out if you're going to go, go forward together. But what was great about Thames in those days, Johnny, because of the union, it was, it was very, uh, you were allowed to move around. So if you fancied a little go in Thames news, you could go and work mm -hmm. in a newsroom. If you fancied working in sport, you could do that, documentaries. 
if you wanted to get a new skill, they trained you in that new skill. It was incredible. The opportunity for me was but just off, once off you're the in, w- once you're in these sort, of, same with the BBC. Once you're in with them, you can mm. skip around like that internally, and oh, then yeah. you always employ internally. But that, of course, leads other people outside, especially now as these things become behemoth, uh, mainstream media platforms that are just devouring the truth mm. <laughs> and, and pumping out falsehoods. Uh, this has become such a dangerous, like these bubbles of power you're right. where yeah, the you're people right. are, you're able to control the people who go in and then keep the ones you like the best just circulating around the area so you've always got the people you trust who will do the things you want to do so absolutely right johnny you're dead right but what was different then was mm-hmm. you had a uh, at Thames, a really great documentary tradition uh, in the 70s. And when I joined yeah. in the 80s, you had things like TVI and World in Action. Now, what's fascinating about those days, Johnny, compared to now, um, they wouldn't make a documentary unless it was an investigation or they had something new to say. Was Roger, and, was Roger uh, Cook on ITV? No, he know. was, but he was he was working in Central at the time, so I, oh, I, I never knew him in London. But, he, yeah, he, he was he, like my hero when I was young. I, I like Looking back on that, I can understand why I do what I, I do, because people like that, it was just like, well, you're yeah. amazing. <laughs> he was he was fearless, and he worked on TV Iron World in action. He worked on those strands, and, and nothing would get made unless they had something to say. Whereas today... It's all about sexy archive, sexy music, confirm an official narrative, i.e. Jimmy Savile is a monster, Donald yeah. Trump is this, Rupert yeah. Murdoch is that. And it's like, yeah, we know all this. Have yes. You new, have you got anything new yes. to say? Yes, that's such a beautiful way to put it. And and w- one thing I'll say about the, the music as well, nowadays especially they use um, a synth and they introduce certain notes. And it's not, this isn't a conspiracy, this is like uh, what they do in movies um, like Inception and stuff. You're, actually running in the background of most horror movies now is this when they want to create suspense is a certain note that creates a feeling of suspense and makes your hair stand up on the back of your your neck and if you've got uh, um, a speaker that can output it you'll feel the fear to some sort of level so what they're trying to do is is uh, target your emotions your emotional content not your intelligence they've they've like moved across to there because if you they target your intelligence then it means you're going to learn more and eventually you're going to see through a lot of it don't think feel Mm -hmm. yeah it's basically the mantra so but in those days you had to think and you were made to think and you Mm -hmm. were challenged in the end it it, it, you know we talk about this perhaps on another podcast about my tv stuff but in the end it it did for thames because they did a very famous program called death on the rock about an sas hit team that took out an RAA, raa team in gibraltar uh, and they wanted to kind of investigate that and show another angle to RAA. To what, what does RAA stand for? The, the IRA. The uh, oh IRA. IRA. I thought you said uh, RRA. I, I no, no, sorry, IRA. Sorry. Oh, so, so right, okay. That, that's, right. that was called Death on the Rock. It was a very famous mm-hmm. program, and Thatcher tried to stop it. And she said, "Look, uh, if that goes out, you know, there's going to be big trouble for you guys." And fair play to Thames TV, they put it out, uh, and it was factual. And eventually, there was an inquiry, and it was proved that it was factual. But Thatcher, after that point, changed the franchise awarding uh, process famously, mm-hmm. and she made it all about money and not content. And yeah, before, yeah, Thames yeah. would always get their franchise because their content was award winning and, and everyone liked it. After that point, she made it about money. And then in 1992, I believe, um, uh, a guy called Michael Green set up a company called Carlton, which, which was basically a company that just did acquisitions. They bought in rubbish mm-hmm. from overseas. And he bid he bid more money than Thames, and he was very he was very into the Tory party. I think he was going out or married to a Tory MP's daughter, so he was very establishment. And they got the contract, and Thames was no more. And in 1992, oh, wow. Thames was it was shut down. That's and today, what, yeah, right. And okay. today, there's not a brick left, not a brick left, Johnny. Of wow, TV. they completely just, obliterated. I mean, that was the power of the the Tories, wasn't it? They they had the the problem is they had their finger in every uh, corporate board. You know, they had their their finger right at the top levels, and they could cause real big trouble all over the place, not just a little little tiny bit of trouble they could make Mm. it really bad for you um and then of course you know thatcher was such a 
bitter person. What a bitter witch she was. Hey, there's not many people in the world who who have been so openly bitter and leaders at the same time. Actually, no. Yeah, <laughs> she won. I mean, but in a way, you know, she she took on Thames. They stared her in the face. They said, "No, there's a you know, there's a there's a point of principle here. We think we've done a good journalistic job on this documentary. Mm-hmm. It's going out. We know it's uncomfortable for the British, you know, military and the SAS." But we're putting it out. They put it out, and uh, Thatcher won. She changed the yeah, rules. Yeah, you, you, you've, you've got, you got it. Yeah, you got to, you got to see that by those events. That really, what that is, it doesn't matter if it's Thatcher. It doesn't matter if it's Thames. That matters. What matters is a military operation that was meant to be secret gets outed. Details get outed, and so they destroy the entity that outs the information, so that the military can continue to do stuff yeah. and behind the scenes and in secret. And that's not a world we want to live in. Because no. trust me, if, for the people who say that's the world they want to live in, we'll eventually be black bagged. You know, we'll be we'll we'll have a suddenly disappear and their family won't know where they are anymore and they'll have regretted ever saying that (laughs) Mm, (laughs) it's true it's true but what what that taught me johnny uh because i I wasn't working on any of those programs i was still very junior i was basically a researcher at the time mainly a film researcher so i i I, but i saw the people that were making these programs i was at the union meetings i i I soaked up the culture i soaked up the bravery and uh, i just thought you know all right everyone lost their living and everyone had to move on and a lot of the older people probably never worked again and there was talk of suicides and all sorts it was a very dark time when Thames lost their franchise. But for me, it was it was a, it was a springboard to other things, which was great. But I, I I remember thinking, okay, Thames is gone, but we can all look ourselves in the mirror and say, you know, that we did the right thing. We tried to do the right thing, and uh, all right, we lost that battle, but there's other battles to come. So that that was a, a, for me a, a very big moral compass kind of setting for me. And the next big mm-hmm. thing that happened just before Thames lost its franchise was the Oliver Stone. JFK film uh, oh, in 1991. Well, well, rock another another uh, moment in my world where where just like everything that that movie I watched it so many times. What it's like three and a half hours long or whatever. <laughs> it's yeah, like I can't remember yeah. quite how how long it is, but it was always so long and always so compelling and enthralling. And you knew, I mean, this was a time when all of the secrets were coming out, and you could feel it. People have waited for an accurate depiction of events that include included as much of the information that was kept out of headlines and kept out of newspapers and that really was the the a dramatic masterpiece the people involved in it joe pesci's performance in it i mean everybody's in it kevin bacon's in it even makes a quick appearance like you know it's everybody's in it um kevin costner is just one of his best movies at the peak of his career and and he's he's playing somebody who was of course like massively important so how did that affect you then yeah that that well I, 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 wow. I, well, well, here's the thing. I know, I know you've got Welsh. You've got a Welsh background, Johnny. My background is actually Irish. My parents are Irish, even though I was born in London and brought up in London. Uh, so JFK, when I when I was I was brought up by a single mother, and she sent me home to Ireland in in the summer holidays. And uh, and often in an Irish house, you'd see three pictures on the wall. You'd see Jesus, the Pope, and JFK. And I, and so from a very young age, I knew that image and I knew who he was. And, you know, he was called, you know, the, one of the greatest Irishmen who ever lived, even though, of course, he was very he was far from being Irish, but he had the heritage. And um, so I always had him on my radar. So when I went in to see this film in 91, I was 25. And I pretty much at that point, uh, I was sceptical, but I took in most official narratives as, as truth. And I, I came out because I knew a lot about his life. Well, I thought I did. And when I came out of that film, that was it. You know, it's a cliche, but that was my red pill moment. I thought, oh, my God, uh, if they could do this, if they could pull this off, you know, kill the most, you know, important man on the on the planet and do it in broad daylight and get away with it. What else can they do? What else have they done since that point? And, of course, JFK then leads into RFK and MLK and Malcolm X. And once you start reading up on all those uh, assassinations that were obviously all bunched together, you think, oh my God, this is, you know, there's almost a, an assassination industry going on here. It's, it's, there's a thread throughout all of them. And the thread is, as you said earlier, the military industrial complex and the intelligence agencies. And, and uh-huh. they're protecting, you know, their control. Yeah. And how do you feel? I mean, well, I, I winced a little bit. People who, who watch body language could rewind um, uh, or facial like tells <laughs> could rewind that then and see that when you said RFK, my face went, 
like a, a little bit just a little flinch in my eyes there because it makes me think of rfk jr today and the road that we're heading towards and like i i, I it's like some of it is i just don't want to look I just don't want to look at the screen because it feels like it's happening again. It feels like we're we're repeating history over and over again. And they they they, they, they have proven that the assassination cover up is one of the biggest tools. Uh, big events cover up really amazing tools for solidifying control and manipulating the masses. And I don't. I even know that the world has changed and the ability to for them to keep information hidden for a long enough has changed like i say to people for for to understand like something like kennedy the assassination of kennedy it had to be like 30 years before people really truly understood and that's that that that, that statement could be said like you know it happened in 63 and it's what 92 the movie comes out that really makes people opens up people's eyes and then people start actually looking into it and it's mm. the rolling ball and then that takes a long time back then you could keep a cover-up going for 30 years and nowadays that's a lot less but that's not going to stop them doing well, there was, yeah, it's not but there was a lot of, of pioneering researchers in the sort of mid to late 60s people like mark lane and stuff who were who were trying to get the truth out but with getting back to what i said about the main online earlier and breaking my lennon story it only really got traction with the jfk truth once that oliver stone film came out into the mainstream and people went oh my god this is yeah you have to it's so easy to control a story that hasn't broken into the mainstream because it just, as you said earlier, you know, when we were talking off mic, it, it just gets sidelined and it gets strangled at birth and it gets just covered up and swept under the carpet. It's very easy to do. But of course, once you start playing with the mainstream, as Oliver Stone did, uh, then there's a great payback there. You know, Oliver was, uh, you know, a pariah in Hollywood pretty much ever since. His career was, I mean, Wall Street, Platoon. JFK, after JFK, his career, if there was a chart, you could see it, it started to go down. Yeah, his projects yeah, yeah, became yeah, yeah. more and more difficult to get off the ground. And he was, you know, he was blackballed. And so what, what an amazing man to do that. But for me, the JFK awakening, let's call it that, was something that just made me from that point onwards always skeptical about anything I was told. It was a very useful tool to uh, guide me in, in the oncoming years. Um, and with regards to the Lennon project that I've been involved with now for the last three years, I mean, I was only 14 when John Lennon died. Um, and I've got to be honest with you, Johnny, he meant nothing to me. I, I barely knew who the Beatles were. I think there was a thing called Stars on 45, the Beatles. That was probably about as much as I knew about it. It was some trashy Beatles dance compilation. So you're talking thing. what, like 1980, 1981 you're talking about here? Yeah, so I was into the. I was into isn't ecstasy, it amazing? Jam, yeah, you know. Yeah, of course. Isn't about. it amazing how eleven years go by and the whole thing, like, like people, they've had so much of it pumped into them that the next generation to come up rejects it so hard that they just don't bother with it. They just like, oh, that's just irrelevant to me. That's what my mum did. That's what my yeah. dad did. There's they, and, yeah. and and why would I want to care when there's bloody Roxy music? <laughs> come, you're right, Johnny. I mean, eventually it comes around and you realise yeah. the Beatles were genius and the Beatles were geniuses. As you get older, you, you realise, oh my God, you know, I, I was... You realise that they, they, that every single artist you were listening to that were inspiring to you were inspired themselves by the Beatles and taught in many ways, including production. People don't understand it. Like, you go into to, to, to in music production, which I've, I've I've done, not always amazing and, not, uh, and sometimes really well, um, but it's a really hard job that's a really hard to bring sound out to record back then they were recording on a four track and they were caught they were recording 16 to 20 instruments and they were multi-track and looping them around and having to use slow down tape to get it perfect because they're you they're using like old school methods what they did was just extraordinary they'd record four instrument put it down to a track and then start recording the, the, the next three tracks neck that they had let spare next to that original track and then they take those seven instruments and they put it down to one track and they start recording it and it, that sort of extraordinary method like built the way i this is this is something i want to express as a, a as a beatles fan who as speaking 
uh, about it me i i want to cry they've been such a like an important part of my life in many ways and i've had a, a weird journey you know like uh, paul mccartney when i look at paul mccartney i'm like he was one of my biggest inspirations for songwriting i loved wings as well i you know <laughs> I, all of his solo stuff up until about uh the sound of wings i think it's called um about 1981 about around then when it just like he became like really trite i don't know what you you'd call it all his music was he like, lost oh. it he lost it yeah, he lost yeah, his yeah, yeah. All, all, all these guys they they they, all do. they they created or nearly all of the methods that led to modern music production nearly everything was done by the beatles every person around at the time who were making music looked at the beatles and were like oh my god that's like the technological future and we can't even get close to working out so it was they they their processes inspired all the young musicians around today so you had then like the production techniques of people like like pink floyd and stuff that came uh, soon afterwards i mean if you listen to pink floyd uh, early pink floyd at the same time as like the beatles i got a bike you can ride it if you like you know and it's all it's all like it's so it's hard to listen to at times it's tinny the recordings are like like all right but it's just like they, they're really concentrating on being completely off their head and psychedelic um but then you go into the latest it's amazing because those techniques had been when i mentioned roxy music earlier i read i i, I mentioned it because like 1973 1974 roxy music is sounding like a band from the 90s like from mm. the late 80s early 90s their sound is so smooth their recordings are so crisp they they the way they they're producing their work only could be possible because the beatles did everything they did because john lennon and paul mccartney um george harrison to a lesser extent um he was much more about uh i mean his guitar and his ability to 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 um link up songs and to like write the middle sections um that really made the beatles without him they you know you you could feel that you were skipping over from one section to another george harrison linked everything together a uh, ringo star was you know a bit part but a very special bit part it was in the hearts of everybody but paul mccartney and john lennon were the guys who were really really strict about the recording uh, paul mccartney yeah he he was really good john lennon was like he was like Hitler when it come down to production. He was like genius. He was screaming at, at, at people in the recording studio when he was doing his solo work because he wanted perfection. He wanted to get the sound. You know, it, what they did for music, for the music that followed, for the music that you completely and utterly fell for in your youth, that even though we can't see it and we don't understand it, later on we understand that the Beatles were behind every single part of it. Well, you're absolutely right, Johnny. And people like XTC and The Jam, who I was into in 1980, when John was assassinated, they all many, many times since have referenced the Beatles as their major influence. They, they influenced everybody. And of course, after 1980, when I got older, I got into the Beatles and I, you know, I realised they're all geniuses who, who completely changed, changed the landscape forever. There's no question about that. But the, the key point I'm trying to say is when I was 14 and this all happened, I remember very much the day it was on the news. Imagine was on 24-7, wall to wall. You couldn't get away from that song. I remember all the maudlin kind of wailing. I remember the, the fans with the candles. It, it was all a little bit of a, I don't know. I, I still find all that a little bit unsettling. But, but you know, at the end of the day, because I don't think Lennon would have wanted that. But what, what was interesting is I, I kind of, I remember how big the event was. But I, I literally, Johnny, I've got to be honest, from 80, 1980 to 2020, never really gave John Lennon much thought. Uh, I always heard rumours that, you know, Chapman might be this, Chapman might be that, or a slightly dodgy murder. But I was kind of such a JFK geek. Uh, I, I kind of, because that's such a massive rabbit hole, the JFK mm -hmm. assassination. I mean, I've got probably I've read about 30 books. I know um, a few so, people who are down that rabbit hole. And yeah, they're, all, they're all as mad as hatters. <laughs> it's deep. It can drive you mad, Johnny. And it's sad, actually. Yeah. There's so many different factions as well in that research uh, field of JFK, you know, who believe one thing and the other ones don't believe that. And mm -hmm. If you believe this mm -hmm. one small thing, then everybody else will dismiss you. But anyway, what happened was in 2020, uh, I kind of, uh, I, I wasn't a fan of lockdown, certainly didn't support it. But I will say one thing about lockdown. It did allow me in March, was it March 2020 when it happened? It allowed me to kind of draw breath for a minute. And I kind of parked all the projects that I was developing. 
some that I shouldn't have been developing. And I kind of, you know, you get drawn into these things and you do it as favors for people. And and I remember March 2020, I kind of looked at my slate and I just thought, you know what? I don't, I don't really want to be doing any of this. I, so I kind mm. of, I cut a lot of ties and I kind of, I, I moved on from a lot of projects. I, I, I got rid of a lot of dead work, let's put it that way. And I, and I felt quite liberated, to be honest with you. And I had a bit of space to breathe. I didn't feel I had to go out and, you know, do a lot of stuff. And, and I, I've got to be honest, even though I thought it was, it, lockdown was a tyranny. It, for me, that one aspect of it was helpful. And the next thing that happened was, I think it was probably April 2020, I was out walking the dog, literally just walking the dog, listening to a podcast about JFK, uh, Black Ops Radio, quite a famous, well-established JFK podcast. And I was listening to that, and I was listening to a guy called Jim Eugenio on there, who's one of the most well-known JFK researchers, uh, also MLK and, and Martin Malcolm X researchers as well. But anyway, I was listening, and he was talking about JFK, and then someone mentioned on this podcast that the doorman at the Dakota when John Lennon was murdered might have been a Cuban, uh, ex-Cuban, far-right, uh, CIA kind of assassin kind of thing. I just thought, wow, that just sounds bizarre. How the hell could mm -hmm. I have missed that? So I literally just went home after the walk, Johnny, and I, I, I sat down at the computer and I started to dig and Google and I know that's only one layer of truth, Google. So I knew I had to go deeper than that. Uh, and the deeper I, the deeper I went, Johnny, the more I realised. Hang on a minute, none of this actually makes sense. Uh, and I, because of my research background at Thames, and I probably have OCD, and I, I, I just I, once I get my teeth into something, I just can't stop. Uh, and I just started to get. I, I used to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And I just thought, there's no detail here. There, there's a lot of when there's a lot of where but there's no how no real specific detail about how and there's no specific detail that makes sense about why this event happened and that troubled me and the more the more i dug i started to buy a lot of books and i started to read the books and again they were all contradictory and they were all very light on detail and i started to get really really suspicious and i just thought you know what I, i've just i've got time here i've got i don't know how long this Lockdown crap's going to last, so I'll just I'll just keep going, uh, which is brilliant. It allowed me to do that, and uh, and then it all just started to unravel. Um, and I think probably at this point, it might be wise for me to tell everyone who don't know the case too well what the official narrative is, and then perhaps we can jump off and talk about what I discovered. So that sounds that a good like plan? a good idea. That sounds like a good idea. So, um, but just before you do that, um, I'll give you how I out about the whole thing because yeah yeah um, please because 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 i i my mum was a deep beatles fan i actually like you know through my teenage years <coughs> maybe from about um uh 11 i'd say till about 17 16 17 probably about the time my mum and start, dad started having a divorce um really i i just around that time as well it's just like that period when your brain changes and you have to be rebellious i didn't listen to the beatles all around the, the rest of the time i couldn't help but to listen to the beatles because we had all of the records uh in the house and my mum was such a deep fan of the beatles and she didn't like paul so much she right. <laughs> she, she you know they've all got their favorites but she oh, was yeah. really like she did really didn't like him she didn't like him partly it's weird it's partly because she loved reading newspapers and msm stuff so much watching msm stuff so much and and they just like it, it, treat him as uh, amazing and then like go into gossip about Paul McCartney and I think it just leaves everybody to being like I don't want to know anything more about him thank you very much mm, just, overexposed just, in a way wasn't yeah. It? yeah and and I think that's kind of maybe on purpose and I think he was he, but he was brought in by the establishment in many ways oh yeah it, it, oh yeah it, every it, man if, establishment yeah, every yeah, man yeah, yeah. For yeah. Sure. and it, it, it feels distasteful I've, I've seen Paul I, I saw uh, McCartney live and like I say I I have been like is for for me if i'm going to say for beatles for 
um music even for the 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 actual songs that came afterwards and the music that they imported into the Beatles McCartney is by far my favorite by far is b- working of the bass guitar is just second to none and he can just he's adaptive he he doesn't have to play he play the um he's got like a rhythm in his head he's very rhythmic and so he can adapt to the notes that go within that rhythm he doesn't have to stick around so he can go up and down and he can mess about all over the place and he can play any guitar and he's just so he's so it's like lackadaisical he's he's just doesn't really matter he's just playing away and that that sort of skill just shone through and but my mum was really strongly a lennon a fan and and most of my friends were really strongly lennon fans and i found it all a little bit mm, lennon give peace a chance imagine all the people it's all a bit like tongue in cheek by that point mm. you know mm. mainly because when i listened to i didn't listen to uh lennon separately from the beatles and and what i took in from lennon was like all of these sort of like airy fairy dreamy yoko ono stuff that just didn't mm. like connect with me at all no and i was just yeah, like yeah. it's all pretentious it's all this all that um yeah in a sense now now i've gone down a road where i look at it and i go oh man i understand exactly why he was doing that exactly why he didn't want to be a part of the system and they didn't show us all of the more important stuff when you hear him actually speaking in depth about what's going on in the world he is a genius he is a genius it's like he can apply what he understands in music and how it works to how the rhythm of life goes as well and how to you know he could see through stuff and explain it to people that was a thing that's so dangerous for the establishment at the time and the more i heard of lennon speaking the more i was like blown away i was like why have i never heard this before why have i never every time he's always saying silly stuff you know uh mi- mixing words around back in the beatles days and say it into, like yeah but words but, but 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 also johnny in the beatles days remember he was a guy who was constantly criticizing religion bravely i think at the mm-hmm. time you know he was calling out religion and the hypocrisy of religion at the time and and the religions uh, religions connection oh, yeah. to the esta- to the establishment and to the the military, you know. So Lenin was the first to do that. He called out the Vietnam War uh, mm-hmm. to his own detriment, and he also called it. You know, he made that, that famous quote about the Beatles being bigger than Jesus. So he was talking about religion and culture in a very brave way. And, uh, and what he did in the seventies, early seventies, you know, he was he was very much into uh, you know Northern Ireland, and he you know he he was very close to his Irish roots. In fact, if you listen to some Beatles people who knew them at the time, friends of the Beatles, a lot of the Beatles when they were younger actually considered themselves Irish because George mm-hmm. and Paul and John all have Irish oh, backgrounds. Hey, 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 hey! Um, for I, I, one day work that I have been researching for donkeys years now will um surface about something, um, and it is part of it is related, uh, uh, like one of the biggest events in history, and I think I've got the answer to, and a lot of it revolves around liverpool and if you look oh. in um 1840 1813 1840 1850 liverpool you've got this place that suddenly gets this influx of irish uh, like uh, immigrants from the famine uh in ireland all come in all at the same time and it increases the size of an already a uh, big Liverpool because Liverpool was the main shipping port out of mm, the UK yeah, yeah. at that point in 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 that uh, in in like the eighteen forties especially, um, mm. and they uh, this influx of Irish immigrants boosted the size of Liverpool and the population of Liverpool by fifty percent, and suddenly there was loads of Irish kids running around without shoes on uh, on uh, trying to steal everything from everybody because <laughs> they had nothing and ev- like this amazing scene if you set the scene of what liverpool was like there it was like this rampant ground where the irish people had been dumped after uh, policies had been implemented to basically force starvation upon their country by the british government and what happened was they were kept in a kind of camp liverpool become this weird camp where you could like they could pick up these kids 
chain is stick a rope around their leg stick a, a sticker on the rope and sell them off to the ships and so these kids were then go, irish kids who had no hope massive families um were, were sold off to the ships by the time they're 13 14 and have no connection to what it's like to really be irish because they got basically no memory of anything but struggle and then struggle the struggle itself became what it meant to be irish that's what i think happened during that period is that the struggle itself and that came out in the character of the irish people so the people who were in liverpool uh, by the time in the 1960s they knew that they were different from the english they knew yeah. they had this massive influence and they did and it's everything music accent the character character well said. A, yeah well you, said johnny go well up said. to you liverpool I, 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 it was my first time in Liverpool was just, I, I've never been to a city and I say, I, I, I've been lo loads of places. All right. And I'm not saying this half heartedly. I have not been to a city which is so loving, welcoming, where the people are just so special and no, like nothing else around Britain, like nothing else. It, it got close bits of it in the valleys and Cardiff, and I think mm. similar background of industry and stuff like that. But Liverpool is a special place with a special breed of people, and they are inextricably linked to a history of Ireland and Irish history and I think the people sure. there know it and they feel it so I can understand I wanted to interject there because no, it's, it's really important to understand like the, important. The, yeah I, Irish Irish and Liverpool is almost the same thing <laughs> yeah know? and that's where the Beatles came from Johnny that was very well put and and uh, you know you're right John and Paul and George knew this and, and it was in their DNA uh, they all had Irish members of their family um, and I think we, you know what Lennon did in the seventies with Irish Republican Republicanism. You know, he he did he wrote songs, he attended concerts. But what he started to also do in the mid seventies is he obviously started to attack Richard Nixon, who was trying to get him deported through uh, you know FBI towers and all kinds of things. It was you know Men in Black were on his tail. If you, I've spoken to many yeah. people who knew Lennon at the time, and it, it was literally phone tapping, Men in Black, a lot of intimidation. So, but John fought that, and then obviously when Nixon fell at Watergate, John was in the front row, laughing his head off at Nixon. So that, so that kind of that Nixon Lennon hatred of each other is the key to unlocking John Lennon's assassination because mm -hmm. Nixon and Reagan were very close, very tight. Oh. When Nixon went down in Watergate, the first person he spoke to on the phone was Reagan. When Reagan won the nomination, first person he spoke to was mm. Nixon. Nixon and Reagan were like that. They were very, yeah, very no. tight. And John took on a very powerful, dark, evil man when he took on Richard Nixon. And I, I'm not going to reveal it uh, until my book comes out, but there is a very clear link to the people that I believe that was behind John Lennon's assassination and Richard Nixon. A, 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 a link that's irrefutable. Well, that, that's intriguing. I'd like to talk. I, I'd like to talk to uh, Doctor Lee about this. I've been on a podcast a few a, a few times talking about the Pottinger pieces recently, and she mm. she talks in glowing terms about Nixon and Reagan. Um, I think it's in context to all of the other people around, and right. these like sides that form because. Um, I mean, if you're talking about the time, by the time Reagan's in office in uh, the in 1980, um, or gets get wins the presidency in 1980, I mean, he's got this other faction behind him as well, which is a really dark, powerful faction. That if and here here we go, right? And this is what what I think Dr. Lee and other people may say. I don't want to put words in their mouth, but I think they mm. may say to defend Reagan and Nixon is that behind Nixon was this dark deep state machine headed by people like henry kissinger and others and then behind reagan was this dark deep state machine headed by george hw bush and others and Rumsfeld, these guys Cheney. yeah these guys were the the were chosen awkwardly as the front people for an ideology that they didn't necessarily agree with 
mm. the butt was in bed with uh, because it suited all of their ends in many different ways. And that yeah, the, Reagan the, for sure. Yeah, Reagan yeah, for sure. Reagan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nixon, Nixon I, I can't see. I can't. But this is what I'm giving. I'm giving the argument of what I think other people who are, are uh, defensive of Reagan and Nixon may say in this regard mm, is that, yeah. the, that the two that in a sense um it, Re reagan and nixon's underlings were the ones who were had the power of assassination and and it, it suited them to use that power uh while these guys were in office because they would definitely get away with it mm. well I, I think office. yeah I, I think nixon it's been well documented was possibly behind the allende uh, assassination oh, and, yeah, gave, yeah, 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 and, yeah. and gave the order for that so i think he was well up for ordering I reckon assassination so. when, I, when, I, it, when it when it suited reagan reagan was a, clearly he was an actor and he was acting yeah, he was yeah. acting a great part i mean he was an actor so i i, 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 hear, I hear what you're saying johnny in in, in essence nick's all, all leaders i think since jfk are puppets and they're, yeah. they're controlling men behind the scenes and probably and yeah uh but and, and i wasn't looking for this, oh. by the way. Yeah, I, I didn't go in with any I know, worries. I, I didn't go with any sort of preconceived. It must be Nixon. He just emerged. The people yeah, yeah, that yeah. I discovered that were probably behind it knew him, and they were connected to him. And I just thought, okay, well then, definitely no. Hey, yeah. I definitely this period i've been carefully watching this period not only through the recent pottinger series which where where pottinger enters into nixon um administration and is able to get mm. away with covering up uh assassinations and conspiracies and all sorts of things and harass people using these these dark techniques and intelligence agencies and then using uh Orlando Letelier and Operation Condor, the assassination of Orlando Letelier and Operation Condor is an excuse to mm. uh, domestically surveil. And that was really interesting place to start looking because I was living in Chile when I started looking in there and it's like, well, Allende and stuff, that was definitely, it, I mean, CIA were right up in front. Uh, and they, it was openly a CIA coup, and the CIA even admitted, "Yeah, well, we, we did all of this yeah, stuff." Yeah. Well, what job. a you, you know, what a of it. And yeah, yeah, and <laughs> and then it it. it it, it led to that moment where in 1976 Orlando Letelier's cars blown up on what uh, um embassy row in Washington um and you've got this moment where is it the Americans have given uh permission for that to happen in some way so that they can then get domestic surveillance for themselves or is it just that they use the excuse to get them you know all, in all of this all of the stuff that happens whether they they're involved in it or not they're going to manipulate it for their benefit all of, of the, these people are in charge and the nixonian uh people the the ford people were the same carter oh, yeah. was i mean the, the um the cia and stuff under uh, carter what that's run by, still by george hw yeah, Bush, Car carter, sure. carter was yeah he was no house and break he was he was a continuation yeah, yeah. So all of these guys look had the same flavor. Once, once they had um, arrested control from JFK uh, by by means that we all saw. Uh, from that moment on, it did seem like the whole thing was sealed up, and everything is an opera is like a selection of operations. After that, really, like carefully planned intelligence operations, and a lot of it was about public uh, perception. Like nearly everything was about public perception and managing public perception. And of course, Lenin was all Lenin was awful for public perception of these guys. So I can completely see, and I know what these guys are doing. They're doing terrible things, terrible, awful things. So why wouldn't you? Um. So so continue. Where were we? Sorry. I, so we, I, no, that's great. No, it's important to set the scene, Johnny. Thanks for that. You know, we need to understand that Nixon was in the background. We need to understand that Carter was no knight in shining armor. He was a continuation of the military industrial complex of the intelligence state. Uh, and Reagan was, you know, he was the, he was the Kaching really. I think they realized they had a man who was completely controllable, yeah. didn't really understand detail much. And, you know, you got Rumsfeld and Cheney and Bush behind the curtain, you know, pulling the strings for the next 20, 25 years. So it worked out really well. And I, you can't get away from the timing with Lennon, you know, when he was assassinated, it was just literally weeks before you know, Reagan took power. 
Um, but we'll get back to the official narrative, which I think is important because it's it's one of the most misunderstood murders uh, in history, really. It's one of the most famous assassinations. It's up there with JFK, for sure, and, and Martin yeah, Luther yeah, King, yeah. I think. It's in the top five of all time. Um, and, and what people think happened is that there was multiple witnesses. If there was anything nefarious, Yoko would have seen it because she was with John. And it was an open and shut case. The guy who did it, everyone saw him do it, and he admitted he did it. He got arrested. He's so horrible. We must never mention his name again. Yeah. It's an open and open and shut case. Why are you digging up this past? Um, but when you actually get into the facts of it, it, it's 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 just not like that at all. So the official narrative, Johnny, I think the thing that your listeners or viewers need to get their head around is they have to get the geography right. So what, what you've got in the Dakota, which is this big Gothic building that John and Yoko lived in, you've got a driveway, which was used originally for horse and cart, and it's kind of cobbled. At the end of the driveway is an iron gate. But before you get to that iron gate, you've got uh, you've got a door on the right as you face it, which has got a little kind of glass vestibule porch area. That's called the vestibule. On the opposite side of that in the driveway, you've got a alcove and a lift that goes down to the basement. So that's the geography. And obviously at the front of the at the head of the driveway is, is the pavement, is the sidewalk. And that's where the doorman had his little gold booth. And that's where Mark Chapman was standing. So it's very important that you you get that geography right. So Mark Chapman is, is at the head, the mouth of the driveway. He's not at the back of the driveway. He's, he's, he's on the street almost. And he's standing near the gold booth on the left-hand side at 10.45 on the 8th of December, 1980, waiting to assassinate John Lennon from what he has described as a compulsion, as a runaway train, as something that he had to do. So mm-hmm. John and Yoko at this point, uh, uh, earlier in the day, I won't get into all the signing the album earlier and stuff like that. Let's just get to the specifics of the murder. John and Yoko were recording a Yoko song called Walking on Thin Ice that night at, at a recording studio in New York. Uh, around about sort of 10.30, John says to the producer, I want to go to a diner and have some food before I go home to the Dakota to, to you know spend to sleep for the night. So they leave the recording studio, but for some reason they don't stop off at the diner. Now, the diner is actually on the way home from the recording studio to the Dakota, but for some reason, which I'll get into later, they don't do that. So they turn up right on time, 10.45, outside the Dakota in a grey long limo. So they pull up outside the Dakota. This is the official narrative, by the way. I'll completely obliterate this shortly. Yoko gets out first. She starts walking down the driveway, past Mark Chapman, past the doorman, and is walking over to the, the end at the right, to the, to the vestibule doors, which lead up some stairs into the Dakota lobby. Through that lobby, you've got some concierge offices behind the sort of desk lobby area on the left. And beyond that, you've got the, the, the apartments, which the doorman, the concierge, sorry, a guy called Jay Hastings, buzzes you through into your apartments. So Yoko's heading towards the Dakota vestibule, up the stairs into the lobby. Behind her, round about sort of 10, 15, 20 feet, it varies a lot according to who you listen to. John gets out of the limo. John walks past Chapman, following his wife, who's way ahead. He looks at Chapman. Chapman looks at him. John walks past Chapman. And now this is according to Chapman and the NYPD and the DA's office. So this is the official narrative. When he's about 20, 25 feet away from Chapman and he's very near the vestibule doors, Mark Chapman gets out a gun and shoots John with five bullets from a five-bullet revolver .38 gun. So it's 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 a chamber. So it's bang. It's not automatic. So it's bang, 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 bang. So he has to wait a split second before each shot. He says he shoots John with five bullets. And Mark Chapman says to this day, he's never wavered. He thinks he shot John four times in the back. He doesn't quite figure out what happened to John after he shot him because he can't remember why John wasn't there. He just he's, he's said in the past that I, I fired the bullets. He doesn't remember pulling the, the, the bead, the hammer. He doesn't remember aiming. He remembers two other things, though. He remembers the fact that he was surprised the bullets were working, which is a very strange thing to think. And he also says he doesn't quite know what happened to Lennon after he started firing. Mm. Lennon just disappeared. He doesn't remember sort of Lennon falling down or opening a door or going up some steps. He remembers none of that. So it's kind of it's a very fragmented memory for Mark Chapman. So what you've got in that driveway, you've got Mark Chapman doing this apparent event. You've got the doorman who's there, a guy called Jose Padermo, who we'll get into shortly, who was the alleged Cuban Bay of Pigs CIA guy, which he, mm-hmm. he wasn't, by the way, but 
We'll get into him shortly. You've got a concierge called Jay Hastings who's in the Dakota, in the lobby area where Lennon and Yoko are heading to. Now, he's got a window that's open that's behind the vestibule doors in the Dakota driveway, so he can hear stuff going on, which is very important. So he's kind of an audio witness. You've also got a lift operator called Joseph Manny who's in the basement, which is accessed through a lift, which is opposite the vestibule doors on the right-hand side, but he's down in the basement. Now, he hears gunfire. So you've got three witnesses of it, but you've got four witnesses that are important. You've got Yoko Ono, you've got Jose Padermo, the doorman, you've got the concierge, Jay Hastings, who didn't see it, but he heard it, and you've got the lift operator, Joseph Manny, who's down in the basement and heard gunfire. So that's the setup, okay? It's very important that you know who, there was no one else there, there was no witnesses walking past the pavement. There was no, there's a cab driver who said he saw Chapman. We'll get into him shortly. But there was no other witnesses that saw the murder. Okay. Now, what's really interesting about this is according to the, the, the statement and Chapman's statement, and according to the NYPD and the official narrative, when John was struck with these four bullets in his back, apparently hollow, hollow point bullets, it's very important that Chapman, the DA's office and the NYPD all say he was using hollow point bullets. They've said it for 42 years. So they all say that happened, which were really destructive bullets, by the way. So when a hollow point bullet hits someone, it opens up inside them. It doesn't normally pass through and it just literally rips up their internal organs. It's, it's a horrific mm -hmm. bullet to use. Um, but apparently John with these four hollow point bullets that all were struck and apparently damaged his heart. We know he's all the artery drain his heart was damaged. He then walks up to the vestibule door with these four big holes in his back. He pulls open the vestibule door. He walks into the vestibule small porch area. He walks up to some steps, walks up six steps, pulls open some very large mahogany open doors, walks into the lobby area, turns left, goes through a swinging door, which is attached to the desk on the left in the lobby area. He's now in Jay Hastings concierge front office. He has the wherewithal somehow to say to Jay Hastings, I've been shot. He then carries on this incredible journey in beyond through Jay Hastings front office into a back office that's beyond Jay Hastings office and collapses and dies. Um, now, the problem with that, <laughs> let's just get straight to it. If you talk to all the doctors and nurses who treated John and even the, the very dodgy uh, chief medical officer who actually performed the autopsy, they all are very consistent in one thing. They all say that when those bullets hit John, the amount of damage around his heart that instantly happened and occurred, he was dead on impact. But somehow, according to the official narrative, John got out of that vestibule, got, got out of that Dakota driveway and went on this fantastical journey through the vestibule stairs, doors and offices. Utter hogwash. It's almost yeah, impossible yeah, yeah. to believe that he could do that. So I kind of, once I got all that information very early on, that this was the official narrative and this was this alleged journey that John went on. I thought, okay, I need to, I, I need to look at this slightly differently. So I thought what I'll do is with JFK, you can tell an awful lot from the, the very dodgy autopsies that were done on him and all the horrible medical evidence that was counter and didn't actually fit the official narrative, especially the early uh, JFK autopsy that was done in Dallas before they managed to nab his body and take it to, uh, to Washington. So I thought what I'll do is I'll contact the doctors I'll contact the doctors that tried to treat John and see if I can get some information from them. Now, the problem with that is there's a doctor called Stephen Lynn, Johnny, who for 30 years has been on every single TV documentary and is featured in every magazine and book saying, I'm the doctor that tried to save John Lennon. And I held his heart in my hand. And I, so this guy has basically controlled the narrative about John's medical condition but he never ever goes into detail about where on the back John was shot and where the entrance and exit wounds were. So he kind of, he, he's annoyingly controlled that part of the story. Problem is Johnny, he didn't actually do any of that. He, uh, he was in the room. He came later because he was the head of the ER. He came later when they were trying to save John, never touched John's body, never helped, never assisted. But he was the guy that came out and spoke to the media and said, John Lennon's dead outside the Roosevelt hospital. And he got a taste for fame at that point, Johnny. And he thought, you know what? I think I'm going to run with this. I think I'm going to be the doctor that tried to save John Lennon's life. Problem is, Johnny, the actual doctor, the surgeon who tried to save John Lennon's life, a, a guy called Dr. Halloran, lovely guy, he, for some strange reason, and I've asked him many times why he didn't do it, he, he just basically sat back for 30 years and allowed Halloran to lie. 
because uh, according to him, he just didn't want he didn't want the hassle, he didn't want the fame, he didn't want to sort of have you um, upset the have Apple you cup. checked out his other autopsies that he's done? This guy. Well, no, this is this is an autopsy. This is um. Or, this or, is the or, surgeon. The, yeah. Sorry, have you seen any? Have you checked out any of the other surgeries that he's done? Or yeah, yeah, he's, had, he's been operating. Uh, it was operating about five years before Lennon came in, so late sort of mid to late seventies. He's operating. He, he, he was a surgeon right up until a couple of years ago. He retired last year, so a, a, a flawless career. Oh, good, guy, good, good, good. Right. Uh, which is great. But what's interesting is I, I didn't ring him first. I rang another doctor. Johnny. I didn't ring Stephen Lynn because I kind of knew in 2011, yeah, yeah. Halloran came out. Halloran came out in 2011. So this guy's lying. I'm the guy who did it. So I knew Halloran was the kind of now official guy who did it. So I, I won't Can you imagine? I, I mean, keep where you're, you're the, the trainer you thought you're thinking. Yeah. Can you imagine being that guy who's just like you've lived off a life like and it's like a indirect lie that'll get you a, a, a really tiny amount of fame in a certain area. I, I mean, God, can you imagine living that life? Anyway, go on. Sorry. I, I don't know how these people live with themselves, Johnny, to be honest. But but, but here's the thing. I, I actually contacted another doctor before I spoke to Dr. Halloran because there's another doctor called Dr. Frank Veteran who also claims that he tried to save John Lennon's life. So I thought <laughs> I'll ring him up and I'll have a chat with him. So I had a chat with him. And he gave me an hour long discussion about how he tried I was, to I, I, I thought you were going to say he was animated like in the yellow submarine when I. <laughs> well, yeah, he was very animated yeah. when he was talking to me, Johnny. Oh. Saying, but what he said was, he said that John was shot all down the left side, right? Which I thought, okay, that's interesting. That's not in the back, as I've always been told, as we've always been told. So he kind of muddied the waters as well, as much as Stephen Lynn. So he gave me this very convincing one hour. Uh, you know, testimony. He also posted a video online of him talking into camera about his traumatic experience of trying to save John Lennon. So I thought, and that something was off. So I thought, I'll ring Halloran. So I rang Halloran, managed to get through to Halloran. And the first question I said to Halloran was, just tell me, Dr. Halloran, why wasn't Frank Veteran featured in a dramatic film in 2016 called The Lennon Report? Because what happened in 2016 was, because there was so much confusion about the medical stuff, Someone did a dramatic film as a reconstruction of what happened to John when he came into the hospital, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. Frank Veteran's not in there. And I said to him, why wasn't Fa Frank Veteran put in the, um, in the Lennon Report film? And he went, well, the reason they didn't put him in the film was he wasn't there that night at the hospital. So I thought, okay, so we've now got a second lying doctor. That's quite disturbing and, and a bit odd. There was also another doctor, a guy it called... Happens uh, a Richard... lot in these parts. Oh, yeah, it you. does. Yeah. Well, you've got a doctor called Richard Marks who did help out, but he also embellished his part in it. He said he held John's heart in his hand. So you've kind of got three line doctors. But anyway, I got to Halloran eventually. And the first thing I said to Halloran was, this is very early on in my investigation, I said, so just tell me again, Dr. Halloran, where John was shot in the back. You know, what, what part of his back was he shot? And he went, he wasn't shot in his back. And I, and I just remember that it was that one moment where I knew my life was about to change. And I went, what do you mean? He said, well, he was shot in his front, uh, above his heart, four bullets in a very tight grouping. Wow. Uh, oh, and, wow. um, and I said, how sure are you of this? And he went, well, yeah. I'm completely sure because three bullets came out of his back and one bullet yeah. stayed in. So, you, so the fact that four went in the front and three came out the back means you can't say that they got confused with the entrance and exit wounds. Oh, yeah, yeah. But it's not, it's not only that. I mean... Um... You don't, uh, uh, you don't fire a, a re four rounds or five rounds from a revolver, um, and get a tight grouping without a lot of practice. A lot. But do you know what he said, practice. Johnny? Do you know what he said to me when I said that yeah, to him? I said, on, I said Chapman was twenty five feet behind him. He said, not even no, a Navy no, SEAL could no, do no, that. No, no, not no, even no, a Navy no, SEAL. Just, even if John turned it's around, there's no way. It's just no way. That is insane. Uh, yeah. It is insane. So he was shot from the front. Uh, and the next thing I sort of said to him was, well, is there anybody else who can corroborate what you're saying? He said, yeah, there was two nurses that helped help me try and save John's life. Diatra Sato and Barbara Camera. They were featured in the Lennon Report film. Give them a call. So I rang the nurses up and I said, right, tell me the story. They said, OK, Diatra Sato was the first one on the scene with Halloran when John came in. They cut his clothes off, as you do. They turned him. So they looked at the four in the front. They looked at the three on the back. They had his body. His body was pretty much naked, so they could check whether there were any other wounds. They said there were no other wounds. Four front, three back, upper left chest. They started to work on him. Barbara Camera then came in to help assist. She saw the four in the front as well. 
after they couldn't save him, Barbara and, and wait a minute. So just just to, to just the yeah. four in the front, three in the back. So there was three exit wounds and three exit was obviously wounds. A and, bullet and one stayed in. in. One yeah, stayed in up, and that was the one they believe was the upper left chest, up upper right. left near near the shoulder. The one that was right, near, right. The, the three near the heart passed through, and they're saying also it's very important, Johnny, to stress this that they didn't move around. They were direct line of fire. They could see from the way they went in the front. They came straight out the back. Now again, remember, hollow bullets don't do this. Hollow bullets stay in. They don't. They're, they're, they're designed not to pass through a person. But for some reason, three of these bullets pass through John. So I said to Barbara and Dee, okay, what did you do next? I said, well, after we couldn't save him, it was our job to wash John and to shroud him. So they took his body to another room. They washed him very respectfully, and they shrouded him very respectfully. And this gave them another chance to see John's wounds close up. And they checked his whole body. They washed his whole body. So they knew for sure there were no other wounds in his back or lower back or leg or arms, just those four wounds in the front, three out the back. Once he was shrouded, then another very strange thing happened. The chief medical officer at the time, a guy called Elliot Gross, a very dubious man who's been accused multiple times of falsifying autopsies, he turns up that night. Now, what's weird about that, Johnny, is he was going to get the body a few hours later at the medical office right, to do the autopsy. So him turning up at a hospital to look at the wounds look at John's wounds, was, was completely unheard of. They, the, the nurses said they just literally couldn't believe he was who he said he was because they'd never seen this happen before. And they were saying, well, what, what, what are you doing here? He said, well, I want to see the wounds. Take off his shroud. I want you to rip all his shrouds off and I want you to sit him up. I want to get a close look at his wounds, which is a really, really weird and suspicious thing to do. So they argued with this guy for 10 minutes and said, look, this is disrespectful. You're going to get the body in the morning. Why do you need to see the wounds now? But he was in a real hurry to see the wounds. So he insisted that they cut the shroud off. They sat John up. I don't want to get gory here, but they said John started to bleed out again, which made them very angry. What Gross then did was he walked around the bed, just looking at John's front and exit wounds, saying nothing at this point, just observing. Then he walks out. And then they had to wash John again, shroud him again, and they were absolutely furious. But what that did, Johnny, was it allowed them to see John's wounds again, twice, close up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So these these nurses are adamant. There's, there's just no doubt in their there's mind. There's no about one else who would have seen closer. Yeah, yeah. These, these two nurses are still alive, and they still can't believe why the whole world thinks the opposite. They feel... They feel kind of isolated and angry that no one's listening mm-hmm. to them because I, I mentioned There's loads that of these people throughout history scattered throughout these cover ups who are for just sure. like w- w- without and and of course they must be very scared for a lot of their life about about saying anything because of course you know it only takes one ad one to g- get to the two. <laughs> this is true, and, and what's interesting, Johnny, is they they kind of um, you know they 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 they, they kind of when the Lennon report came out they thought, oh, great, this film's happening and it's a drama and we can have some input. And they did have input and the producer spoke to Haller and the nurses and uh, they, they read the script. They went, hang on a minute, this script's wrong. The script says he was shot in the back. It's wrong. He was shot in the front. And they all sort of had this slanging match with the producers for ages. And the writer came in the room and the writer said to them, well, you know, we're going with the back. And they said, why? He said, well, that's what Wikipedia says. And the nurses said, the nurses came out with this great quote. They said, well, Wikipedia wasn't in the room that night when we tried to save John Lennon. So how the hell does Wikipedia know? Which is a great line. Um, no, that's yeah, a the, real <laughs> shot, man. That's a real shot. Yeah. Just just, just brilliant. You know, New, New York, no messing nurses who, who just mm-hmm. say it as it is. They're wonderful ladies. And um, so basically then that, that, that kind of got me then at, at that point. Uh, when I got all that information, Johnny, I just thought, hang on a minute, there's a cover up here. This, this is not not right. Chapman couldn't have caused those wounds from where he was. So I thought, I ne- now need to find out where John was when he was struck. Was he in the driveway? Was he in the vestibule? Where was he when he was struck? So I thought, I now need to sort of talk to all the people that were at the Dakota. And I now need to talk to all the people, all the police officers and the detectives that tried to do the case. So I, I went deeper and deeper. But just before I get off the medical stuff, one other thing that's really important to know is what would have really given us on given history the, the, the complete lowdown officially on John's entrance and exit wounds is what's called an ER report that Dr. Halloran and the nurses all filled out that night. So Halloran started it and had a stick drawing of John's front and John's back, like a stick man with the entrance wounds and the exit wounds put on the stick man and a full re- written report underneath saying 
this is where he was shot. This is where the exit wounds were. This is what we try to do to save him. We cut a little thing into his chair. So we try to pump his heart, blah, blah, blah. That ER report went missing that night. No mm. one knows where that ER report went. When the Lennon report went to find it, they said, forget it. You're not going to find it. They couldn't find it. They went through mm. all the hospital records that disappeared that night. And one of the, one of the main bits of evidence that would have completely mm. verified what those doctors and nurses knew just disappeared. This world is so simple. It's so simple. They, they, I mean, you, you, it, there's certain moments when they know, okay, we can leave all of the rest, be hearsay, conjecture, just people talking. Uh, we, we could paint it all of that, but only if we take out this piece of information and this piece of information, and then the cover-up's done. As long as you've got the key uh, fundamentals not written down on paper and everything just comes out of people's mouths, you can just deny, deny, obfuscate, and you can move on. And before you know, things become legend and and if it does get too hot, you, each time it gets hot, you just implant a load of fake information uh, onto the scene. You push in a load of people who are, are going to promote different ideas that are kind of like got all of the facts there, but a little bit of detail here and there that's just going to, you know, skewer the facts forever because or, or obscure the, the facts forever. Um, I, of course, I, I can hear you. Um, suggesting that's happened all throughout this because it's what you see in for sure ever up anyway. for sure poison um, in the well johnny poison in the well yeah yeah and, uh, hey yeah. hey l listen i i i uh work in an area where now i just like oh man i, I i've just i've had a few years where, where a few years like the 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 I, I've had many experiences uh, over the past, say, four or five years where I feel that people have tried to enter into my life, um, especially early on one one experience before I got into the Epstein case with um, a, a random Mexican. <laughs> I, live in, <laughs> I live in Wales. I mean, <laughs> Mexicans stand out when you live in Wales. Yeah, I bet. Uh, just uh, suddenly turned up in in Cardiff and and started dealing weed to me and becoming like then 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 like doing LSD with me and then doing LSD and trying to implant things in my head, including like uh, flat earth stuff and all different types of things in a way that I I sat there like I I I had already been through like a lot of psychedelic experience uh on my own terms and i can i'm like you know um uh, a high level drinker i understand the process of what happens in reality when i'm extremely high on an epic dose of lsd or mushrooms so i don't just i understand the difference and i've been through multiple situations where i think people have tried to implant loads of different stuff into my mind and i've let them i've let them i've let them go one day listen well, I continue along along a path. One day, you know, I, I I'm gonna tell the story of my life. Maybe, maybe if I get that far, if I if I get that far, because I am wow. I am treading a dangerous road. I can tell the story of my life, and some of it has been messed up. And these people use all sorts of methods to get into your mind to <laughs> to, to make the people who are most likely to tell the truth to poison that well specifically. If mm. you fight, if they see someone who's very able to uh, who's able to be concise and cut through the bull and get to the point that they don't want you getting to then they'll poison they all they have to do is poison that well so when you're talking and, and this is the same when a cover-up on the scene any type of cover-up in, in, includes this so when you're talking about the statement you're talking about the characters who are there on the night when lenin uh, lenin shot and he w walks into this area where one person is apparently the official story is one person isn't going to see it. One person downstairs hears a gunfire. There's, you know, there's not much in the way of witnesses here. Is nope, that so a lot, a, a lot of ability to control everything? And I've heard like within and and <laughs> this is a dangerous thing to say out loud on the podcast. But um, it, there's a man who gets attacked heavily by the BBC called Richard D. Hall, and some of his work is is impeccable. Um, and one of one of the things he looked into was a Joe Cox murder, and it's within.
in the statements, uh, you've got that Joe Cox gets shot in the head and someone goes towards her to help and she gets up and says, no, no, please, please don't stay back, stay where you are, stay where you are, and then get shot again. Now, in moments like those, whether it's the statement itself uh, or it's like how how it gets uh, the person who's given the the uh, witness statement, or whether it's in the uh, the police uh, are somehow corrupt, or whether later on that gets tampered with, or people get influenced in other ways. You know, you it it just one piece of little piece of jiggery pokery makes the whole case hard to work out and makes a lot of people turn away from it because a lot of the time especially when events like this assassinations are fresh you're going to have lots of uh uh theories and then they die away eventually so where were we where were we sorry i i, I had to go off on a tangent there no it's I, important I feel... it's, it's important what you said i i think um we, we, we got to the point where the medical evidence, Johnny, just didn't tally up to the official narrative. So what my next move was, was to get hold of some official documentation. So I got to know the lead detective, a guy called Ron Hoffman, through various phone interviews I did with him. Mm -hmm. And on one of the interviews, I, I just got a feeling that he, he kind of knew he didn't do a very good job. And he kind of, I just felt he wanted to get rid of, he wanted to absolve himself. And the way he hinted he wanted to absolve himself was by selling me his notebooks and all his paperwork, oh, which I which I gratefully accepted. Uh, so I have a very good media lawyer friend of mine uh, who does these kind of things for a living. And he flew over to see Ron in Florida and met Ron's family because he does these things properly. We got Ron's family involved and we uh, exchanged some monies and I, we managed to get hold of Ron's original notebooks and interviews and paperwork which was extraordinary. And it just, for me, that just opened up the whole case because what that did was it gave me access to all the original uh, interviews that were done on the night and, and subsequent days afterwards. It gave me it gave me access to inventory vouchers of evidence that was found. Mm -hmm. It was just like shining a massive big light into mm -hmm. a very dark uh, tunnel, which is almost what the Dakota is, almost uh, driveway. So for me, that was a game changer for me. And, it, and I then started to realize that I had, an advantage over everybody else that's kind of looked at this uh, this murder because I could listen to what people said now and then I could go back and look at what they said back at the time, literally hours after the murder. And often they didn't quite match up. Now, that doesn't always mean it's nefarious. Sometimes, you know, the memory plays tricks. The official narrative mm. has been so well sown and so well told over so many years, unquestioned for so many years, people then start to see the official narrative and go, well, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I didn't see it that way. And maybe this documentary that came out 30 years later knows hey, better. Hey, hey, listen, if they were to go back in history and look at some of the statements I made while I was like working in hotels about events that happened in the nighttime, I could tell you they're not getting a true, completely true version. Some of the exactly. stuff that was going on was supremely naughty. <laughs> and there was, uh, there was a lot of it going on all of the time and people don't, talk about the stuff that incriminates Sam or makes them look naughty or make them look like they're wild on drugs partying and etc you know they don't they don't look at these things good point good point Johnny and 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 you know the mind plays tricks let's be honest uh, mm. but so the first thing I wanted to ask Hoffman was or one of the most crucial things I wanted to ask him was what did Yoko say uh now the problem mm. with Yoko is she gave five statements that night uh and the days afterwards five different statements and they're all different which is really troubling. Wow. Sometimes she says she's she got out of the limo first, and then a few hours later she said, no, she got out of the limo after John. And then a day later she'll say, well, sometimes I was in front, sometimes he was in front. So she constantly covers You didn't her... need to come into my life and bring me this nonsense. Yeah, mate. it's big, it's big. I mean, I, I have no evidence she shot her husband. Or she yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know, I know, I know. But you, 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 you know that there's, there's, for this... For for them to assassinate a person, they need to, to, at this point, they've had a lot of experience. If we're talking about the same, roughly the same people who mm -hmm. have done the m multitude of assassinations that have come yeah. over the previous decades, they've had a lot of experience and they know how to uh, create an area that is perfect for control. And, um and to implant the right people those people who will get close so if they've got someone working um somebody uh it's really usually the 
people who are closest to them. So, well, yeah, yeah. and Yoko was she's a problem because she was a heroin addict in 1980, so she was obviously you know that that would have compromised her on some some degree. Okay. So that's that's a potential factor. She's all, I, I think, she was also Yoko Ono. She was also Yoko Ono. If you talk to a lot of people in the Beatles world, a lot of people who grew up with the Beatles, which I did do, I, I spoke to a lot of their friends. They're all convinced she's involved. Mm-hmm. If you talk to people who knew her at the time, they're all convinced she's involved, who are not her friends or her publicist. There's a guy called Eric Mintz, who's a mouthpiece, who obviously wouldn't say that. But I, I had no real evidence. So I, was, I was very troubled that she kept on saying, I was here, I was there, I was there, almost covering I, her back for I, any I, eventuality. I've, just, very, just very quickly, I also, for people who have recently read my Pottinger pieces and, and I've read about Gloria Steinem's role, the faux feminist uh, CIA girl who uh, went out with Pottinger for 10 years um, and ran loads of different operations, uh, was recruited in India by the CIA and talked in glowing terms about the CIA. There's a clip within the article where she's going, oh, but they only did good things and they only lies people and stuff. And basically she was made into a a feminist by being, uh, by having a little party in her hair and wearing leather and and that's all it took and basically what she did for a living was nothing it was like it was there was nothing there um and i don't want to accuse yoko ono of not being talented at all um in to any degree not having a bit of talent but still managing to get through life um on maybe on the back of someone else's talent but i am probably going to do that over and over again in life <laughs> so sorry yoko but i i, I mean I, I there's a lot i think there's a comparison to be drawn against what i i think yoko Ono designed herself to be, and what Gloria Steinem designed themselves to be. Could be, could be. I time. mean, yeah, yeah. She's I, struggling, just Johnny. comparisons. Yeah, I, I, no, that's I've interesting. always felt, that's interesting. I, I'm, I mean, she might. I'm, yeah. I think that 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 you know, we both can say that she has never been uh, convicted, tried, arrested. No, no. Uh, and, uh, she, and 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 you know, different different statements may have been a PTSD thing. You know, yeah, it was a yeah. traumatic event. Well, well was... that's a part. Okay, so there, there, there's a problem. Now, we're discussing whether um, Yoko Ono is involved in some way because of that fact that there's, you say there's five different statements. How, yeah, how she, differing are they? Very different. Where she says John was, where she says she was, when she heard gunfire, mm. where, what she did immediately after John was shot, what John did, all different all very slightly different and it, it's kind of is that ptsd or are you just trying to um, <laughs> it's impossible to say okay, but what okay. i do know here's what's important Johnny, just quickly finish mm-hmm. on this point the one thing she never has said in 42 years in those five interviews she gave at the time which i've got now recorded and since she's sometimes briefly mentioned the murder in documentaries and books that she always says she doesn't really want to talk about it but sometimes she lets little bits out what she's never said ever in 42 years is she saw Mark Chapman shoot her husband. Never said it. She Mm. said she heard gunfire. John said he was shot when he was walking in the glass doors. Uh, She followed John up and she said, you know, she said, get an ambulance. But she's never, ever said, I saw Mark Chapman shoot my husband. So if she was in front and she was waiting at the vestibule, she should have seen it. If she was behind John, the actual lead detective thinks that she was behind. She thinks, he thinks that uh, Mark Chapman stood between John and Yoko he actually thinks that John was ahead. Chapman stood between John and Yoko, and Yoko was behind Chapman. Now, if that's true, she'd have seen everything. But she's never, ever said mm. she saw Mark Chapman shoot her husband. So that's crucial because you'd think the, the person who was next to John or near John that night going into the Dakota would have seen the event. But yeah. she never did see the event. That's, that's really important. Enormous. That, that Very is important. quite enormous. Um, yeah, it d- does ask... Um, uh, a lot of questions so what are we talking then in reality we're talking that the two people who were really present the only two people to be really present were supposedly chapman and Leonard. the doorman and the doorman. and the doorman now what's interesting about the doorman johnny you think that'll be the most important important witness statement of all time wouldn't you right mm-hmm. the doorman should have seen it all we've never been okay, allowed that, to see it okay we've it, never it, been allowed it, to see it you know missing. you know you know if this is if this is what we got if we've got the doorman 
that makes no sense. Um, th- th- we should know everything about that. We should know everything. Let's get into him. Let's get into Padermo. Well, the first thing we need to know about Padermo is we don't have his statement. For some reason, the DA's office and the NYPD, they release most statements, but that one, they won't release. It's been sealed. I- I've spoken to people at the DA's office. They said, yeah, we interviewed him multiple times. Where's his statement? We, we don't get I think the reason, after what I've investigated and spoken to other people, who think they saw what what the doorman did and they spoke to the doorman afterwards and they got an account of the doorman. The doorman saw nothing. I think what happened with the doorman is he kind of, he let John and Yoko out of their car. He went back to his gold booth, heard gunfire and back into the driveway. The event was over. John wasn't there. Yoko wasn't there. So the, the, the problem with the doorman's account is it doesn't actually bolster the official narrative, which is a problem, which is why I believe it's been concealed. Um, but what's interesting about Padermo is for seven years, from 1980, the, December 1980 to 1987, no one knew his name. It was always just referred to as the doorman, right? yeah. which gave everybody. So everyone was kind of thinking, well, who is this guy? Then a, a, a journalist called Jim Gaines, who I've done an article on my Substack about. He's a member of the, he's a Council of Foreign Relations, a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, you, you can't make it up. Yeah, but he is actually a, a bona fide journalist. They're not always bona fide when they're attached to this case. Uh, and he was at the time writing for People magazine. And he did an article in 1987 People magazine about Chapman. He got access to Chapman's cell, recorded lots of interviews with Chapman. And he basically said Chapman was talking to the doorman that night. He revealed in 87. The doorman was an ex, ex-Cuban, anti-Castro uh, guy who was talking to Chapman about the JFK assassination and the Bay of Pigs. Right. Oh, so that's everybody... convenient. Yeah, yeah. So oh my god. A of, yeah, a lot of red flags there. All red flag, red flag, red flag. So basically, everyone went, okay, Bear Pitt, Jeff K, Cuba, Castro. Okay, let's look. <laughs> Jose Padermo. So this is pre-internet, but somehow they got to find out. Probably, I'd say in '99 when the internet started to come into use, they realized that there was an operator at the Bay of Pigs uh, called Jose Padermo who was in a group called Op 40, Brigade 2506, who were a group of basically CIA ex-Cuban far-right assassins who were going to go in after the Bear Pigs and clean up Nazi style and execute anybody who wasn't part of the program. So Jose Bayer Pigs, Jose Padermo, was a very, very serious individual. I mean, one of the most serious individuals. Because if he was in charge of this brigade of assassins, imagine how serious Jose Padermo was. Now, Jose... Jose worked with Frank Sturgis. Frank Sturgis has often talked about him. Sturgis says that Bay of Pigs Jose died in 74. Now, I've looked into Bay of Pigs Padermo, and he was born around about 1912. He died in 74. So ah, it kind of, pretty it, old, man. Pretty old. Pretty old. It kind of fits. The problem is I've actually yeah. found out about Dakota Jose Padermo now, and they are two different people. Dakota yeah. Jose Padermo was born in 34. He started working at the Dakota in 69. He stopped working there in 96. He then went on and he died in 2010 or something. So I've, I've kind of got his timeline. He's a completely different Jose Padermo to Bay of Pigs, Jose Padermo. But what's interesting is I think Jim Gaines was dropping in the ultimate red herring here. I, I just think because ever since that 87 article, every single John Lennon assassination theory article, book, whatever, some, some people have even written books about this, have said, oh, it was Bay of Pigs, Jose Padermo. He's the most serious assassin in CIA history. He must have killed John Lennon, but he wasn't the guy that was on the door. It was a different Jose Padermo. And, and it's kind of, it's, it's, it, we we're talking earlier about poisoning the well. It's just, it's poisoned the well now for a long, long time. Now, I think Dakota Jose Padermo is a very suspicious individual. And I'll tell you why. One, they're concealing his statement, which I think is suspicious in itself. Two, he, the actions that he did on the night of the murder are very strange. According to the official narrative of Mark Chapman, what Dakota Jose Padermo Dorman did was, after gunfire, Chapman doesn't remember what happened to his gun, but he remembers that it was on the ground in front of him. So perhaps he he dropped it there, or perhaps someone else dropped it there. Jose Padermo then kicks the gun, and a witness says he saw him do this, to the back of the driveway, okay, where the vestibule doors are. He then goes and walks up to the gun and starts pacing around it. Now, Chapman at this point is docile. He's taken his coat off. He's standing by the, by the corner of the driveway and by the roadside. He's got his catcher in the rye book out, and he's starting to read catcher in the rye. Almost, you could say, like a programmed assassin that somehow slightly malfunctioned. But so what's convenient is, you came in. So, so yeah. convenient you came on uh, a week after uh, Dana uh, came on. Brilliant. And- 
Brilliant. Talk yeah. about so, MK so, Ultra sub oh, Well, sub-cross. we're going to get into MK Ultra. I'm going to blow yeah, your mind yeah. of MK Ultra in a minute, Johnny. So basically, it's going to come into our story very big, very shortly. So basically, what the doorman Jose Paderma does, the curtain, he goes to the gun, starts walking around. Now, I told you about that lift operator, didn't I? Joseph Manny, who's down in the basement. Now, he hears gunfire. He comes up with two colleagues, and the colleagues verify this in the written statements that I got. And he comes out, and he sees Jose Paderma. And Joe Manny goes, what's going on? What, what was that gunfire? And he said, Jose said, pick this gun up and take it down to the basement, get rid of it. Now, at this point, the gun is not with Chapman. It's with Jose at the back of the driveway. Okay, We don't know that's Chapman's gun, but somehow it's there. Ask yourself this question, though, Johnny. Why didn't Jose pick it up himself? Mm-hmm. Chapman's docile. He's kicked the gun away from him. Chapman's reading the book, just doing zero. Why did Jose not want to pick that gun up and hide it himself? Why did he wait for someone else to turn up and actually grab the gun which he did with his own fingerprints. And what, what Joe Manny then did was his two co-workers was he grabbed the gun, did what Jose told him to do. He went downstairs to the basement, put it in a drawer, came back up into the driveway and went into the back office where he saw Lennon in the back office bleeding out with Jay Hastings and Yoko Ono. Okay, so Joe Manny is quite an important witness. So he, but always when he came back up the first time to get the gun, when he came up the second so time, so you think he he's Chapman. he's he's the only uh, like uncontrolled witness around this point. By the he is in a way, Joe Manny, because because I because I've got two other witness statements that tell me what he did exactly. We know he's not lying. Sadly, Joe Manny has lied a little bit in the interviews I've done with him. He's tried to erase the two co-workers that came up with him. <laughs> he's tried to sort of get all the glory himself of picking up the gun and sending it downstairs but he what joe didn't know when he was telling me all these tales was i've actually got all the statements and i know that these two people did come up with him and they went back down with him and they came up with him again so he's he slightly embellished it to make himself be the sole kind of witness Mm -hmm. but what's important about joe manny is when he went into the back office to see lennon and yoko and jay hastings concierge a, a dakota resident called jack henderson came down to the scene and said he saw joe manny and Yoko, and Jay Hastings, and John's body in the back office bleeding out. So we've got, a, we've got a kind of witness who had nothing to do with the people who were working there that night who said he saw that scene. So we've got that. So here's the thing about Padermo, though. After that, he disappears from history, right? He, 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 but what's really suspicious about Padermo, Johnny, this is what's incredible, is even though he was a doorman, a few months leading up to John's murder, he wasn't working the door. He, he allegedly had bad legs. And he was working in the back office with Jay Hastings as concierge. And Jay Hastings and Joe Manny were doubling up to do the door for, for Jose Padermo because of his bad legs. But that night, that particular night, Jose Padermo says to Jay Hastings, my legs are feeling okay tonight. It's quite a warm night. I think I'll do the door tonight. I think tonight mm. I'm going to work. I'm going to work the front. Mm. I'm going to be next to Chapman when he's there. I'm going to make sure that I'm right on the action, which is what he did. And he did work the door that night and saw what he did and did what he did. But then after the murder, I know, I know, it's so suspicious. And then after the murder, Johnny, do you know what he does? He goes back into into the back office the next day and says, I don't ever want to work the door again. So the whole world, when all the cameras were fixed on those gates for days on end, you didn't see Jose Padermo's face. He was a ghost. He He made sure of it. And he carried on working at the Dakota for another... I believe it was 14 years, possibly 16 years, where he worked the back office in the basement. He was doing menial tasks, but he never, ever worked the door again, and he disappeared. So it it is he is a man of great interest, because if Mark Chapman was triggered by somebody, which is the case, I believe, in Siren Siren and the RFK assassination, you do need someone there to kind of trigger a Manchurian Mm -hmm. candidate to think he's shooting blanks when he's not. Jose Padermo would have been the guy to do that. He would have been right next to Chapman, just him and Chapman all by themselves, ready to, ready to go so it's uh it's really important that you get all these statements see what what's a murder like this which is why i'm hoping the book will reveal most of it is you have to take in all these different witness statements johnny you have to take in people like joe manny slightly changing the truth yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. And, 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 and you have to kind of give it your best guess because yeah, there's, yeah. there's so much noise around each statement and around each perception of the murder it's, it's but when you actually coalesce the forensics and the the actual where Chapman was and where Lennon was and where Yoko was, and when you work out exactly the geography of the murder itself, you then realise that Chapman couldn't have done it. Because here's here's the really important thing. I said to Ron Hoffman, the detective, I said, Ron, where did you think John was when he was struck? He said, well, he was on the stairway. Beyond the vestibule doors, in a part of the Dakota entrance that Mark Chapman could not even see 
never loan, shoot Johnny. Remember, Mark's out at the front of the driveway. The stairway is inside the vestibule doors at the end of the driveway, up some steps. So it's, it's kind of completely out of Chapman's view. So I thought, how do I get this verified? So I spoke to Jay Hastings. I said, when did you hear gunfire? He said, well, I heard the door open, the vestibule door. I heard John walking up. I heard the door open, i.e. the vestibule door squeak open. And after that point, when obviously John is now inside the vestibule, then I heard gunfire. And then he said he heard gunfire. He heard the, here's another interesting point. He said he heard the vestibule windows break with some bullets going through those glass, glass panels in the doors after gunfire, not during gunfire. He heard gunfire. Mm -hmm. Then he heard those windows pop out. Now, those windows are really important. If you go to my Instagram page, Johnny, Assassination of Lennon, you'll see there's various images that have been – people have tried to conceal these images, but we've managed to get some shots of these, these doors now. There's three bullet holes in these glass panel vestibule doors. But the problem is, Johnny, they're all really low down. They're really low down. They're not upper left chest, upper left back. They're kind of stomach lower back height. OK, so if they were the bullets passing through Chapman shooting from the back in the front, they're in the wrong position. OK. Mm -hmm. And another really important point, Johnny, is there's no blood around these these glass panel bullet holes. And I've spoken to. People that I spoke to the cops and the Dakota workers, I said, was there any blood splatter around those bullet holes? They said, no, there was no blood splatter whatsoever. So those bullet holes were caused by someone missing John, not hitting John, because if they were hitting John, they, you're still there, Johnny. Yeah, I'm still oh, you're there. there. Oh, perfect. Oh, perfect. Right. Are you talking you about, around. is it Yeah, this? yeah. Yeah, that's one. That's the bullet hole in the far vestibule mm -hmm. door and you can see the stairs that john staggered up but if you, there's another picture further down of the two bullet holes if you go well done putting this up if you go right, <laughs> right give me a, give is, me a second to work it out very impressive I'm on, I'm on, oh, hey, oh it's for, a future it's keep, a future keep going keep going you'll get to oh, um, there's uh yeah, this one there one there that, that's there too. that one there that would do it now Look at that's the door that John walked into. You can see the handle that he had to pull open. That's the one facing Chapman and the, and the roadside. Look at those two bullet holes. Mm -hmm. Two yeah. now. If you go back, if you go to another one, which is a full length, if you can just go to one more, please, Johnny. A yeah. bit further down, that one there. That there one see, there. we see the door. No, no, oh, no we no, see the door and the, and the guy's standing near the door. That's that it. One. That one. Yeah, have a look at that one. Now, see the two bullet holes, right? See the okay, guy standing. Oh behind, yeah, I see. I see. See the I guy see. standing behind the door. Mm -hmm. Right now, that that okay. little bit of light—that's not a bullet hole. That's just a, a crack and a light reflecting oh, off the crack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the two bullet holes there. That's it. It's those two there. They are lower back. They're not upper left chest, mm -hmm. and there's no blood splatter. So they could not have been caused by Mark Chapman shooting John and the bullets coming through John's front and into those holes. And remember, behind those two men is the bullet hole we saw just earlier, leading up to the stairway. So for Mark Chapman's bullets to actually cause that, they'd have had to kind of gone around in a boomerang fashion wow. to get through. Yeah, that so doesn't those, make any sense. <laughs> yeah, those bullet holes shouldn't be there. So do you know, here's, I think I'm now at the point now, Johnny, where I can kind of reveal what I think happened, is I think what happened was, and Ron Hoffman has actually said this on my YouTube channel, there's a clip, there's a news, a piece of news rush, it's never broadcast. If you go to my YouTube channel with Sasha and Lennon, you can see a Ron Hoffman statement that Detective Hoffman, the lead detective, that he gave outside the Roosevelt Hospital. And he says quite clearly, probably an hour after the murder, before the official narrative has been bedded down, that John Lennon was shot inside the vestibule. Inside. Not mm -hmm. outside, not going in. He was shot inside the vestibule. There's mm -hmm. another, another, another guy called Sean Strube, who was a, a, a witness who came along after the murder and got a lot of press coverage, but he didn't see anything. But he said he spoke to the doorman i.e. Jose Padermo, and again, it's on the YouTube channel, and the doorman says to Sean Strube, John was shot when he was walking inside the vestibule. So we now know that John was shot in an area that Mark Chapman could not see in the front and not the back. Mm -hmm. So what I think's happened is it's very much a Siran Siran RFK playbook. You've got a patsy, a program patsy, not a program Manchurian candidate, because MK Ultra was very much focusing in those days on, on getting an MK Ultra. Patsy, not assassin, someone who wasn't there to kill, but was there to pick up the tab for the murder. And what mm -hmm. happened with, with Sira and Sira and RFK is, and Lisa Pease has done a great bit of work on her on her book, A Lie Too Big to Fail on this, I think she's nailed it, is that Sira and Sira was there shooting blanks to take attention away from the real killer, 
who was standing behind RFK and shot him in the back of the head. And we now know from the autopsy that's come out that that's exactly where, where RFK was shot. He was shot from behind, not the front. So they always yeah. get this kind of front and back exit thing. So I think Chapman was triggered. Padermo is clearly, a, is clearly a, a suspect for this. To start shooting when John was by the vestibule doors, he starts shooting blanks very loudly. A cab driver called Richard Peterson said he saw him there with a gun at the foot of the headway, at the front of the headway, at a driveway. So we know we've got another witness that put Chapman there and not at the vestibule doors. So he's 25, 30 feet away from John. When John heard the blanks firing, he goes into the vestibule area, which is where he would have gone anyway, to get away from the gunfire. Mm -hmm. I believe the assassin... The murder was there, and I believe he was using a silencer. I believe he, he walked up to John and surprised him and shot him four times, close range, which is what they all say it should have been, including the detectives on the night of the murder, said he must have been, Chapman must have walked up to him and shot him at close range because they, they were so professional. Shot him four times, upper left chest, and I believe he missed with three bullets, two or three bullets that then went through the vestibule doors because the assassin would have been on the stairs shooting down into John coming up the steps. And I believe those three bullet holes were caused by the second shooter. And I believe the four holes in John's upper left chest was caused by an fish, by a, a second shooter that was concealed in the vestibule area. And once that was done, that shooter could then go back into the, into the uh, Dakota if he wanted to and mm. stay wherever he wanted to stay, or he could have gone back out into the driveway. And if, if Chapman was imagining he was doing something that he wasn't really doing, which is what I believe happened, I believe the second shooter could have walked past Chapman. And I doubt if he would even know what was going on. So and that, I, and that is, I believe, what I'm almost, I'm convinced now that that's the only feasible way that Lennon could have been assassinated when you take into account the forensics on the ground, what Chapman said he did, what the medical evidence gives us, and what the detectives at the time said, or where the detectives at the time said John was shot, which is inside that vestibule area, area on the stairway. So you, you, you've kind of, it's, it's game, set, and match, Johnny. It's game, set, mm -hmm. and match. There, there really is no other feasible way. Now, you could say, and they do say, perhaps John turned, which is a really important thing. Chapman could have called out because one of the narratives that they tried to get into the media was Chapman called out. He must have called out. Chapman has never said he called out. Really important. Why, and if he did, why would he conceal that? I, mean, I called out and turned. I shot him. Chapman said he shot him. So why wouldn't he add that detail? Jay Hastings. The concierge said he never heard anyone calling out to John Lennon. Interestingly, Yoko Ono, in a written statement from Ron Hoffman's book that I put on my Instagram channel, you can actually see the writing yourself, says quite clearly, we heard a noise in the street. We never turned around. We kept walking. So even Yoko Ono said they never turned around. And even if John, let's just say if all of this isn't true and John somehow did turn around and nobody heard it and Chapman didn't remember it. This is what would have to have happened, Johnny. He'd have had to walk toward those vestibule doors. Chapman would have called out his name. John would have turned around, right? And for those bullet holes to be in those low down positions, he'd have had to get down on his knees or stoop. Chapman would have had to have shot him four times in his upper left chest area in a type of loudly, bang, 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 bang. And John would have had to stand exactly dead still mm -hmm. for three of those bullets to pass through him and then somehow dive bomb down into those low glass panel doors and make those bullet holes. At that point, with these four bullets in him that have ripped his heart apart, which we know is what the doctors and nurses said, his arteries, his main arteries of his heart were ripped to shreds. He then turns around. Thank you, Mr. Chapman, for shooting me four times. He walks up to that vegetable door, pulls it open, walks up the stairs, walks through some other doors, walks through some other doors, walks through one office, goes into another office. It's just, it's just BS. Clearly... Yeah. That's so how does he get into the how does he get into where now, he gets to eventually? That's a really, really good question, Johnny. Really good question. And that was something that I've had to really work hard at to assess. And this is where it starts to get a bit dubious with Jose Padermo and the concierge Jay Hastings, because here, here's here's the anomaly. Joe Manny, the lift operator. When he came up to the scene the second time after hiding the gun, he said he went into the concierge's area and he saw John in the back office, okay, which is where Jack Henderson, the Dakota resident, said he saw him and where Jay Hastings said he ran into. But he's, Joe Manny says two other things. He says Jay Hastings' shirt was covered in blood, like literally covered from head to toe. Mm -hmm. So he assumed John must have ran into his arms 
And Jay Hastings also said that there was a pool of blood in Jay Hastings' front office, right? And Jay Hastings just imagined seeing this scenario. But Joe Manny must have imagined seeing this scenario, the lift operator. But what he thought happened was John must have ran into Jay Hastings' arms in the front office, collapsed on the floor, bled out a little bit, and then somehow Jay and Yoko must have dragged John's body into the back office, right? Mm -hmm. It's the only scenario that he can put together to, you know, come to a conclusion of how that pool of blood got in the front office. But Jay Hastings said no. Joe Manny wasn't there, though we know from Jack Henderson's testimony that he was. Jay Hastings said that there was no Joe Manny. Joe Manny never saw any of this. And John just ran past him and ran into the back office. Then Yoko came in a few minutes later. Oh. So that puts Jay Hastings in a slightly dubious Ooh. dubious place for me. They're uh, all in I, a very dubious place. They are. They, they are. You know, Joe Manny, Hastings, and the Padermo, none of their witness statements match up. None of, they're all, they're yeah. all, they, were all, they were all there. And they're all dubious. They well, all lie. Well, Dakota lobby sounds like a nightmare. To be perfectly honest, if you want to get <laughs> to does. your room, you it does. Yeah. For for but someone who's thing. worked in many lobbies in many hotels, I can tell you that's not a place I'd want to work. I'll give you another little bit of detail, Johnny. I'm giving I'm giving you all the goodies tonight uh, or today. Basically, a man who worked with the Lennons, a guy called Michael Medeiros, who was their kind of plant water archivist, nice guy. He was working with them before the murder and after the murder. So he was there. He said the, the morning after the murder, him and the Lennon's bodyguard, a very dubious guy called Doug McDougall, who was an ex FBI bodyguard. For ah, the Lennons. Did you believe that? Sorry, sorry. FBI did Lennon. you? Yeah, wait, 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 wait. So we've we, we got to repeat a couple of things. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Let's go for it. Um, <laughs> you said you said the words together without with a straight yeah. face. You said yeah. Doug McDougall. Yeah. That's Doug right. McDougall. Yeah, you said Doug, Doug McDougall. Doug McDougall. Doug Dougie. Do the Doug Dougie. Yeah. Do the Doug Dougie. Dougie McDougall. A good Scottish fan. So, okay. So, you got Doug McDougall doing the Doggy. And what else have you got? Well, well here's what's else? amazing about let, Let's fill in Doug McDougall here. Doug McDougall let's... was their bodyguard, hired by Yoko Ono in the summer uh, that year. Uh, oh. And he was an ex FBI man, right? Oh. Now ah. the pe yeah ex FBI agent and I, I, I mean for more... people who don't understand the FBI were really the instrument used uh, for to harass Martin Luther King for many years and eventually assassinate him in a sense. There, there's more I'm going to go into about Doug McDougall in my book. Trust me, a very dark, nefarious character with mm -hmm. links to all kinds of dodgy things. But for now, let's go with this. This is the narrative. This is going to blow your mind. A, a few weeks before Lennon's murder. Doug McDougall upset Yoko by saying to her, you're being, you're being a bit loose with your security, allegedly. You need to keep quiet about your movements and where you and John go because you're going to get hit. And she said for that, for giving her that information, allegedly Yoko put him on a leave of absence, right? And he was due to come back to work, guess when? The 9th of December, the day after John's murder, which he duly did. He turned up early morning, 9th of December, to start working yeah. for Yoko again, oh. which means... No oh, body guard. He did guard. the doggy. He did yeah, the no, doggy, doggy. Do the doggy, doggy. Doggy McDougal doing the doggy. Yeah. So no, no body guard there uh, that night, uh, Johnny. Uh, Doug wasn't working because Yoko made sure of it. So, again, he must felt awful. Dubious, dubious. So anyway, he turns uh, up that night and he, he brings in the Pinkerton Agency, right? You know them with all their machine guns and the whole thing is locked down with guards and agents with machine guns, all ex-FBI, dodgy, dodgy men, locked down the whole building. But anyway, Michael Medeiros, the next morning, let's move off Doug for now. Michael Medeiros, the next morning, is asked by Doug McDougall to accompany him downstairs to talk to Jose Padermo, of all people, the doorman, to find out what the Padorman saw and what the doorman knows, right? So they go down and when, when Michael Medeiros told me this, I thought, at last, I'm going to find out. <laughs> what Jose did and what he saw. It was like, a, again, this light shining into a dark tunnel. So according to Medeiros, uh, he didn't see anything. He basically, as I said, he went back, to, he let the lenders out of their car. He went back to the gold booth that he stands in next to the Dakota driveway. He heard gunfire. He came out, didn't see Lennon, saw Chapman standing there. Then he ran to the vestibule stairway area where he saw Lennon's stricken body on the stairway which fits with what Hoffman said and what everyone you know which we now know is where John was hit he then picks John's ailing body up bleeding out body 
carries him into the lobby and into Jay Hastings' office, possibly front office, possibly back. Take your pick. And then he goes back out and confronts Chapman and kicks the gun to the back and Joe and Joe Manny comes up to get a gun. Now, here's the problem with that. When he told me that, I thought at last, we've, we've got the full truth now and they're, they're concealing his statement because he didn't see anything and he can't shore up the official narrative. But when I spoke to Jay Hastings, the concierge about this, who you would imagine would see Jose carrying John's body. Into no, the lobby most the definitely you would see him, wouldn't you? He said, no. He said, no, that didn't happen. Didn't see Jose. John mm. just came running in with bullet holes in him saying, I'm shot, ran past me, ran into the front office, ran into the back office, collapsed and died. Uh, now, here's a problem with Joe. Another problem with Joe Hastings is his, his shirt, his bloody shirt that Joe Manny insists to me was just covered in blood. Jay Hastings actually sold this shirt uh, a few years back. And Whoa. it's uh, you can you can Whoa. see it on my Instagram. Wow, wow, wow. how you much can see did it on my that... Instagram. Oh, I think he got yoy. about 30 grand, 35 grand for it, something like that, $35,000. But here's the thing. It's not covered in blood. It's not covered in blood, Johnny. It's got a few spots of blood, mm -hmm. but it's not covered in blood. Mm -hmm. So, again, someone is not telling the truth here. It's not. If you go right, it's one of the most right to the top. Right to the top. Right to the top, nice... and you'll see it. There it is. There's the shirt oh, itself. Oh, why this one by here? Yeah. Does that shirt look covered in blood to you? No, no. So no. then, when I said, I said to Jay, how did, how did Joe <laughs> looks manage deep around the pits? There it looks deep yeah. around the pits for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's looks a like spots. an old shirt, but but there's kind of three spots of blood. Interestingly, opposite John's. No, I, I listen. I, I once, I, I remember. Um, I worked in one hotel where we had um a guy who walked in at like three, four o'clock in the morning while we were doing the cleaning up. It was the whole day in in Cardiff City Centre, uh, opposite the castle. And I was managing the place, and I was with this guy, a, a friend of mine who I'd got a job there called Spook. And we got attacked by this guy who would come randomly in. We told him to leave. He wouldn't leave. We 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 just tried to coax him out, and then he started attacking us. But the problem was for him, he was terrible at attacking us. So we we had it all on camera in the end because there's courses in the lobby of a hotel. So we were dancing around, and one of us was pushing him while the other one was attracting his attention. And we did this for a while until his some mates turned up, and we run over to get his mates and we're like can you sort out this guy and then I turned around and he's like running towards me so I swung the guy around in a circle um, and his his face went straight into um, a, a, like a, a revolving door basically um, and he lost a load of front teeth I think and he broke his nose and the whole there was blood everywhere and he just slumped to the floor and we thought he was dead and it was his mates standing around looking and we were standing around and it was just a stop for a moment because we just there was no movement and we were like, oh God, this has ended badly. And uh, and my friend Spook leant down and just touched him slightly. Um, and the guy swung up and Spook had this wonderful Versace shirt on. He very cared very much about his brands, did Spook. And the guy covered it in blood, completely covered it in blood. Like it was proper, like all drained as he just tried mm. to get on top of mm. him and just was spraying blood out all over the place. And so the, he, he, that shirt was covered in blood. Now, uh, that that looked like a nightmarish scene, and I, I like the, the that shirt. You, there's no way that that we're talking about the same thing. But anyway, you're right, Johnny. And I, and I said, I said to Jay, I said, Jay, why did Joe Manny say your shirt was covered in blood? And he said, Well, it probably got bloody. Said when I helped the cops carry John's body out to the police car, which is allegedly what happened. In fact, I know mm -hmm. it happened because I spoke to the two cops who carried John's body out, who came on the scene and carried John's body out to the police car, and off to the Roosevelt where. You know, all the doctor and nurses merry-go-round happened. And um, I then said to the two cops, did you see, did Jay Hastings, the concierge, help me carry the body out? He said, no. No, he never helps carry the body out. I spoke to Joe Manny about it, and he said, nope, Jay Hastings didn't help carry the body out. I spoke mm -hmm. to witnesses who were out on the street who saw Lennon's body being carried out. Did you see a concierge in the Dakota helping the cops? No. No one, mm -hmm. no. It was just the cops carried John's body out. So Hastings said to me he got a lot of blood on his body, on his shirt, helping carry John's bloody body out to the police car or the cops which he didn't actually do so Hastings is but again it could be like Joe Manny where just people just embellish and add and try to make themselves more in a story you can only do that be. for a certain amount of time and if you're doing that within witness statements then it's criminal isn't it 
Yeah, Hastings, and here's another thing about witness statements and Hastings. That's an interesting segue. Hastings never gave a witness statement. How strange is that? I said to him, why didn't you give a witness statement? Why didn't you go to the police station and give a witness statement? He said, they never asked. I didn't want to do it. Uh, and we know we know Dakota Jose went down there. We know Joe Manny went down there. Okay, okay. We know so Adult that means went down there. That does mean that it is more likely that if that was true and he did do it for those reasons, it is more likely that he would embellish or change his story over time because he wouldn't have had any reason not to. Um, uh, like if there's a document that is written down somewhere, people tend not to. Uh, turn away from it just in case it come up again in the future so yeah that, that would make sense go on dog walker went down there dog walker went down there <laughs> elliot gross when he came to dakota after he we oh. went to visit the dakota the chief medical officer he spoke to one person can you guess who he spoke to who he went to talk to that night jay hastings no wow. jay hastings the concierge the only person he spoke to jay doesn't remember that conversation but we know it's on record from other people that he spoke to jay hastings. so jay's a very interesting character got no proof he was involved in the murder but he's a very, very interesting man. He left the work at the Dakota about a week after the murder, maybe 10 days after the murder. Mm. He suddenly left the scene immediately. He said he was sacked for being late, which I don't believe after seeing such a traumatic event that anybody would sack a worker for being late after witnessing what he witnessed. But that's what he said happened. Um, so I, I think I've kind of laid the scene with forensics and witnesses and all the different conflicting evidence. I think we've, we've been going two hours and 15. You're right. Just continue a little bit more, Johnny, because I think what I want to tell you now yeah, yeah, yeah. is where is where MK Ultra comes into this. Because yeah, obviously you, this is a good place to like segue yeah, towards you. Good yeah, segue. Yeah. So Chapman, yeah. Chapman went to the police station that night, Johnny, and he gave a statement, which I, I put on my sub state. I called it Mark Chapman unplugged. He didn't have a clue what he did and why he did it. He said he had nothing against Lennon, nothing against the Beals. He didn't know why he did it. He just felt a little part inside him was fighting a big part and the little part lost or something like that. And he just felt he had to shoot John. He was compelled. He couldn't stop wow. himself. It was a runaway train. A confused man. He didn't even remember the gun being in his hand. He said, I don't know where the gun went. He said, I just remember I looked down and I had a book in my hand, capturing the right. And all the words were kind of fuzzy on the page. And it was like his brain was malfunctioning. Oh, one other last thing about Jose Verdum, I should say, just before we get off all the witnesses, Jose said, according to Chapman, get out of here, run away, right? Which is a very strange thing for someone to say once a gun is no longer on this person and this, they're docile reading a, a, a novel. But also a secondary witness who I managed to get through the files called Nina Rosen said that she heard when she came back on the scene a few seconds after gun, hearing gunfire, she heard Jose say to Chapman, you better get out of here. The cops will be here shortly. They'll be here in a few minutes. Now that doesn't sound to me like the sort of thing an innocent man would say to a killer who's standing there docile without a gun on him. That's kind of like he was, for some reason, Jose was desperate for Chapman to run. Jose was out. expecting a certain thing to a certain series of events to happen. And yes. suddenly there was a malfunction it didn't in Chapman. You got it. You got it. Okay. So there could be a, a it could, it could be that there was a secondary operation that that went once Mark Chapman to take started. Chapman out because Central Park right. was across the road. If Chapman went to run, I believe Chapman was meant to run, and I believe he was meant to be taken out, a la oh, Oswald in the cinema. Yeah, yeah. And I believe I believe he wasn't meant to live because they, there was some very nefarious people, Johnny, who I reveal maybe in another podcast with you in my book, who were desperate to talk to Mark and get in his cell after he was arrested. Desperate. Very strange intelligence linked people who were desperate to get into Mark Chapman's cell. Now, one of those people who got into his cell, this is what's going to blow your mind. So if, if, if you imagine that Mark Chapman is, we, we, well, we know for a fact now that he was imagining he was doing something that he couldn't possibly feasibly do, right? So he's having some kind of psychotic episode. You could say he was hypnotized to think he was shooting John Lennon when he wasn't. You could say, I would say certainly. So is there any evidence of MK Ultra? intelligence hypnotism going on in Mark's in Mark's life. Well, here, here let's let's just get down to it. I, I won't go into all the hypnotists that were throughout Mark's life leading up to the murder, but there were many. And they were linked to Christianity, they were linked to the military, and he had hypnotists in his life all through his life from the age of 15 to the night, wow. 25 when he shot John Lennon. And one of them, one of them was a very nefarious character who I believe broke Mark's mind through charismatic christianity and exorcisms and this man actually 
was a well-known preacher who was a well-known hypnotist who was part of an organization would you believe johnny in the 70s that actually tried to fuse christianity or should i say religion and hypnotism as a good thing they even had conferences mm -hmm. where they talked about how these sh things should be fused together now these charismatic exorcism prayer groups that mark went to mark said he was deeply disturbed by them mark was just coming off a major lsd binge and he was he was being kind of i believe at that point that was where they were breaking his mind to make it malleable and i believe they did it through this speaking in tongues laying of hands and and from that point onwards till the day till today mark has always been convinced that he was um uh, possessed by demons and i believe that particular thing was put into him by this preacher slash hypnotist when Mark was 15 in 1970. In fact, I, I know it's a very nefarious character. I'll reveal all about him in my book, but this guy is a very, very dodgy guy. And I believe he was hired very early on to start grooming Mark Chapman to break his break his mind and get his mind ready to be, to be uh, used in a nefarious way. So let, let's get to Mark in his, in his cell. A, lawyer was hired called herbert adlerberg but after two days he got so many death threats on the phone he decided to bail yeah, uh, the absolutely. second the second lawyer that came in was a lawyer called jonathan marks a public lawyer who for a public uh, attorney was working in a very plush office called 30 rockefeller plaza mm -hmm. which is a which is a quite an expensive place to work for a, a one-man band doing pro bono work uh, but Jonathan Marks worked there. But also another company that worked in that very same building was a company called Donovan, Newton and Irving, which was basically the CIA's law firm. It was uh, it was it was run by and set up by, would you believe, Wild Bill Donovan, the man oh, who actually, God. yeah, the man who set up the CIA. <laughs> that was his law firm. And it was a wash with CIA spies and spooks, some current, some old. William Colby, the very same CIA director from the Watergate hearings, he was actually a member. He, we worked at that firm for, for wow. Newton. Now, what's really interesting about that firm is a man called David Suggs, who worked at that firm in 30 Rockefeller Plaza, went to work for Jonathan Marks, Mark, Turn Mark uh, Chapman's attorney. How cozy. So what you've got there is a link with a CIA law firm and Mark Chapman's attorney. Because yeah. I was always wondering how these nefarious characters I'm about to tell you about got into Mark Chapman's cell when they came from Mark Chapman's defense and then when i found out about this david suggs and about the cia law firm he worked for and the fact that jonathan marks was in the same building it was all very cozy now i'm not saying that suggs and marks are, uh, are you know did anything uh, untoward they might have just been suggested to use these people i'm about to tell you about and they put them in mark's cell unknowingly knowing what they might do to mark but you do have to ask questions don't you so the first guy who, who bowls into mark's cell to analyze him to assess him was a hypnotist that Jonathan Marks decided to tell the world about in the New York Post. I'm going to get Mark Chapman hypnotized to find out what's going on in his mind. He actually, you know, it was a front page news headline story. Oh, but this guy's God. name, this is what's going to blow your mind now. Let's go back to MK Ultra just quickly. Just, I'm sure most of your listeners and viewers know MK Ultra was a CIA program that was multifaceted. There was operations left, right, and center. It went on for decades. It was all about mind control. It was about using psychedelic drugs. It was about it was about getting true serums. There was hundreds of offshoots, but it was basically one of the main core elements of MK Ultra was to try and create a Manchurian candidate who could kill somebody and not realize they were killing them and forget why they killed them after they killed them. So that was a big thing. And the guy that actually was hired by the CIA to head up the Manchurian candidate assassin MK Ultra program was a guy called Milton Klein. Now we know this because in 1979, Milton Klein went on a documentary, which you can find on my YouTube channel. There's a clip on there where he basically boasts that he can create a Manchurian candidate in a matter of months to kill somebody nefariously for the CIA, which he said he was a consultant for. Milton Klein was the first hypnotist that was put into Mark Chapman's cell by Jonathan Marks. Milton Klein got unfettered access wow. to Mark Chapman. Not only that, Bernard Diamond, the nefarious hypnotist who was working on Siran Siran in the RFK case, he waltzes in to no. Mark Chapman's cell. Yes. No. Yes. Come unfettered, on, guys. unmonitored access. Come another one Rich on. Oh Richard my Bloom, God, these another guys. one, Richard Bloom. Richard Bloom, military intelligence background, hypnotist. He waltzes in. 
Now, the problem is, after Mark spent many months talking to these guys on the record, off the record, there are tapes of their recordings, but you can be absolutely certain they weren't pressing record all the time. Mark then rings up his lawyer and says, I've decided now not to plead innocent. I don't want an uh, insanity, innocent plea. I'm going to plead guilty. I've decided there's going to be no trial. I'm going to plead guilty. And they said to him, why, Mark? Why are you pleading guilty? He said, well, a little voice inside my head. This is what we were told years ago. A little voice inside my head. I think it was God said to me, plead guilty. Right Now, I found out through my research that one of the things that Milton Klein was trying to implant in Mark's mind, because he's actually Jim Gaines, our Council of Foreign Relations journalist, revealed this in his 87 articles. Milton Klein talked to Mark about a little people kingdom that Mark had in his head. This only came from Milton Klein. Milton Klein was very keen to talk to Mark mm. about a little people kingdom. Half the kingdom were the devil's forces. Half the kingdom were God's forces. And Mark and Milton talked about this. No, none of Mark's friends and family have ever talked about this little kingdom people thing before. This only came from Milton Klein's visits to Mark. And I've discovered now through Mark's appeal in the mid-80s that it wasn't just a little voice in God whispering in Mark's ear to, to plead guilty. It was actually what happened was this is what Mark thought he saw in his cell. He saw a battle between the little people of God and the little people there were having a battle on Mark's cell floor. The God's little people won the battle, won the war, and God's general got up into Mark's palm. And God's general from the little people whispered into Mark's ear, plead guilty. Ah! Ah! And this is the exact little people scenario oh. BS that Milton Klein and Milton Klein only was discussing with Mark Chapman, the oh. CIA Manchurian candidate. He was obviously sent in there to get Mark yeah. to plead guilty mm -hmm. through some BS reason and make sure that everything I've just told you for the last two and a half hours about the forensics and the witness statements and the medical never came out in a court of law. Because if it of did, course, yeah. it would have been thrown out. It well, would have been I, thrown out. Yeah, can you believe think, that? Yeah, I can. And it makes me keep the 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 the, the thing that keeps coming round, the thing that keeps coming round to me in the in seeing all of these different cover ups and cases is this question of um like discovery in cases needing to have a trial to in, in, in put evidence forward so that it is forever within the the ether and stuff. There needs to be a way to put evidence forward not connected to a trial there needs to be a way to do that there needs to be a way to um have like forms of discovery that cause this like a, like, a, like a, you're right a police right. service like a police service that you report a crime to and then like, they go and investigate yeah. like that but that's what we don't have at the moment we is is we don't have this always comes down to these like tiny bits of min it's amazing the listen the story you just told me and we've been talking for for a good two and a half hours so i think we're coming up to the end now for sure yeah yeah there's, um, there's more but i think we've hit most of the main targets but, so but yeah you, but i'm i'm i've been in full by this story throughout the entire time and i i, I will go away and i will like two bits of this up because there was certain elements of the story you've told to me which kind of like clear up uh or at least i, I don't want to say clear up I, I like like get, add extra weight to how i think these operations look like when they were being mm. enacted so like the actual mm. assassination and then the the one mechanics to, to cover up yeah. yeah and it always seemed to be that one of the problems they've had m multiple times is that they can't control the patsy um, and where he runs off to i mean um yeah often that that like tro trying to work out what the patsy did just post assassination is usually the eye opener to what was actually happening yes yes the, you know, before they can it, get to him yeah and then afterwards of course they 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 when it, he doesn't get wiped off they have to bring in um a big guy to uh mess clean around up. in his brain yeah, yeah. they got they got to clean it up I think uh, just to finish, Johnny, I think you need four things to pull this off. You need to groom and condition Mark Chapman to be ready to be a patsy. And that that's a long, uh, this process I'm pretty sure took over 10 years for them to do. And I, I could see the line 
and, and it's this hypnotism, 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 intelligence, intelligence, hypnotism, hypnotism, military intelligence, hypnotism, mm -hmm. all the way through the line, all of them, all nefarious characters, all controlled Mark, all the way through. You then need someone on the scene to execute the job. You need that second shooter. You need to get the timing right. You need to have someone there to trigger Mark Chapman, and Jose Perdomo is a major suspect for that. Mm -hmm. uh, you then need an NYPD. We haven't even talked about how they just didn't do an investigation, Johnny. Mm -hmm. but that, that driveway was open the next morning. They mopped up the blood that very night. In the office, it was mopped up. People were coming and going through that driveway the very next day, mm -hmm. the very next day. Yoko Ono, another slightly bad dark, dark mark against her, was after the autopsy the next morning on the 9th of December, which was conducted at 10 o'clock that morning, she cremated his body, John's body, that very afternoon. That very afternoon. She got good old Dougie, Doug McDougall. Oh, ex -ex -FBI, Dougie. Ex -FBI. Do the dig it, Dougie. Do the dig it, Dougie. Do the dig, Dougie. Do the dig, Dougie. And at a massive piece of evidence, i.e. John's body, which the defense, if they were doing their job, would have asked for a, a second autopsy and photos and, and x-rays, mm -hmm. but they didn't get a chance to because Elliot Gross, Mr. Dodgy medical officer himself, did the autopsy, which has still not been concealed with the public, but the, what I know about that autopsy, it's complete BS. I know fair, a few facts that are on it. None of them match up to what the doctors and nurses say, but anyway, that body was very quickly disposed of. So we lost the ER report and we lost John's body. When you lost those two things... The, the real evidence that would have blown this all apart was taken away instantly yeah. within hours. So you've got that. So you've got, you need, you need an NYPD that are not going to do their job properly. And they're going to clean up the scene and take away spent bullets. By the way, we still haven't seen any spent bullets evidence. There's no oh, vouchers. No. Yeah. We don't know what, what, but we do know that from the morgue receipt, there were two different types of bullets, one hollow, one non hollow. You oh, can see an article whoa, about that on my whoa, sub stack. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Different types of bullets that came from John's body. So, again, dodgy, dodgy. So you've got the NYPD who don't do their job properly and cover up. And then the final piece of the jigsaw, you've got people like Jim Gaines, another journalist called Jack Jones, who was actually an intelligence agent, uh, who do the media uh, narrative story. And those two guys, Jim Gaines and Jack Jones, for 42 years have had a clear run through books and magazine articles and documentaries mm -hmm. to sow the seeds Ooh, of the official yeah, John Lennon narrative. Yeah. Those are guys I've run. seen. I, those are the type of guys that I've seen uh, work on on cases before. They bring out these. It's always a couple of coppers, a couple of journos, and they basically mop up all of the information yeah. and make it. And, I, and, and, and the mainstream I, media say nothing. They how just, that comes they, to fruition, I do not know. I, how that comes to fruition, like how how they can uh, and how they decide how they recruit, how it's managed. Um, who it's multifaceted. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, so, so, so it's not yeah. it's not one body, it's not one group. I think it was a disparate, connected bunch of people who all came together, pro possibly under Richard Nixon's auspice, but it may have gone beyond him or above him or below him. But there was a I, I identified a group of people who were all hired to do certain particular jobs in this operation, mm -hmm. and they came together to have that one outcome that they all wanted. Because remember, John Lennon was anti-religion; he was anti-capitalism. And most importantly, I believe he was anti-war. So mm -hmm. there was a lot of people who would have wanted to take him out for what Reagan was about to do in the 80s because of those reasons. And, and I think, you know, he was a, it was a very convenient murder for Reagan's government. It was a very convenient murder, uh, you know, okay. for, for that regime. No, I, I just, I, I, uh, thanks for being on, David. Listen, no, thanks, this, Johnny. this, this, this is really important uh and i feel a little bit teary about it i feel that 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 in that case then it sounds like like the legends of the working class hero like it came round full swing didn't it? he he, yeah. he did not disappoint one iota uh, Great. john lennon was legendary highest order uh full of love full of care battle Brave. to the end Brave. And, yeah. and taken yeah. out by the same evil the same monsters that defend all of the evils in the world yeah all of the things that 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 john lennon stood up against it's extraordinary Agreed. extraordinary what a what a hero God. he was he was so brave he, he, you know he he walked it like he talked it johnny and uh, I he knew I he put himself 
in harm's way. He knew. He knew. Uh, he was. I really mean that. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. I'm going to sit outside my house. I'm going to get my laptop on. I'm going to do some research, uh, edit a few things. Great. Maybe please, do this. And please. I'm going to stick Help Lennon out. on. Yeah. I'm going to stick Lennon on nice and loud. And I'm going to have a, a few tears uh, over a, 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 um, a, an alcoholic ginger beer, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, you know, we should remember what, you know, it's horrible. I've been in this dark murder now for three years, Johnny, and sometimes you forget the light that John gave us through his music and his message. Oh, yeah. and, and it has been, that light has been dimmed through his horrible murder and the bullshit that's been put around his murder that we've all had to swallow now for 42 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I get people online saying, oh, you know, you're disrespectful to his family, for, you know, looking into this now. I think the only disrespect to John and his family is ignoring the truth. And John was obsessed with the truth or trying to get to it. And he was a very honest mm -hmm. man, often, you know, to his own detriment. And I think he would want his murder to be properly investigated. And that's all I want, really, Johnny. I want his murder to be investigated properly, which it clearly wasn't done back in the day. And I don't think the mainstream media are going to get on board because ultimately if they do, what they're saying is, Johnny, is for 42 years we got it wrong and there's a lot of ego in there. And there's also a yeah. bit of cowardice and they don't want to be called conspiracy theorists and they're just going to just go along with it until they can't, till, it, till the noise becomes so big that they can't ignore it. And I think I'm a few years away from that. Hopefully my book will lead to that. We'll see. But it's um, all my forthcoming book. So we'll, we'll see what happens, Johnny. I can sleep well at night now. I've, I've gone down this hole now for three years, and it's 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 not. I wouldn't say I've enjoyed it to be honest with you. And, I, and sometimes I even sort of say to myself, Johnny, why the hell am I doing this? Uh, I, yeah. I I feel compelled to do it. Hey, I hey, feel hey, I've got hey, a responsibility hey! I got something going it. through my mind. I got something going through my mind. Yeah, no, I please gotta, do. I got to say to you at this point, like um. Me and you, we do a similar thing. We look for these cycles and we look for these events and we look for the way it works and we 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 watch it turn around and around and it just all I could hear was Lennon's uh, his own song. I remember sitting on my way uh to work one time and and being really feeling really sick uh when I was at my sickest and 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 on was uh i'm just sitting here watching the wheels go around yeah, yeah great song i just love to watch them that that's that's i think what we do we look for the wheels we look for the cycles we are watching the same things and he was watching the same things and in the same time we do it with the the uh the, the hope that things can get better from knowledge yeah so thanks it. can you tell people um uh, where they can find you. And what, what yeah, they... thanks, Johnny. I think most of uh, what we've spoken about has been put uh, in article form on my Substack, davidwheeland.substack.com. Please go there. Please subscribe. Please share. Uh, get the message out. There's about 20 articles on there now. That's They're all in-depth. You can find a lot of video and, and image uh, information on my Instagram and YouTube channel, Assassination of Lennon, all one word. And I'm on Twitter, uh, Lennon Murder. You know, you can follow me there and hook up with me there. And my message to everybody is, please spread the word. Let, let's tell people that John Lennon's murder is was not investigated properly. There is a thousand anomalies that need to be addressed. I'm not saying I have the complete 100% uh, solution to what went down. But what I am saying is what we were told went down clearly didn't go down. And we need to find out the truth because we, you know, we owe John Lennon that. We owe him the truth for all the great things that he's given us in his lifetime. And, you know, his message of truth and bravery and, and standing up to power is a message I think we can all still get hold of and, and, and use to, to move forward. And cheers, David. Thank you for so much for coming on. And uh, Thanks, Johnny. Uh, it's, it's, it means a lot. It's been emotional. No, I've really enjoyed it. And I hope, have I, have I now convinced you that, that there is stuff to look into now? Have, yeah. Have you, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, well, I think, I think, I think what I'll say is that, um, there's a lot more to learn, obviously, and I'll be uh, getting to know more because me and you will be speaking again, won't we? Oh, for sure. There's lots more to talk about. Thanks, Thanks Johnny. For coming on the podcast.